Now, if you're going to be working in any type of Microsoft administration services these days, there are some fundamental principles that are very important that you understand. So what I want to do is I want to get into some of the foundations of understanding things like Microsoft domains, understanding some of the networking technologies, RAS and VPNs and virtualization, and also we're going to talk about the cloud services and how all that fits into this. But it's important to kind of start from the beginning so you can understand where things have been, understand where things are going, and you have to consider the fact that you know we're, the world is transitioning now more into a cloud-oriented uh, environment, but in the past everything was managed on-prem or on-premise, and we got to talk about this transition and how things were and how things are now and where Microsoft is going. So to start with, you know, we go back go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s. They had mainframes, these gigantic computers that would take up like entire rooms. Uh, they used vacuum tubes. And then as we moved into the 1970s, something miraculous happened. They created what was known as an IC, an integrated circuit, which allowed uh, basically binary math to be processed through little chips and this is where personal computing became popular so in the 1980s personal computers started coming out I'm gonna draw this little symbol here to represent a computer and uh, I tell you what I'm gonna create another little uh, symbol here to kinda represent a bunch of computers so in the 1980s companies started buying PCs and personal computers and they started showing up in people's offices and eventually you know they were networking them together and all of that and so this is where things really get started now of course in in those days one of the problems was we we lived in what was called a peer to peer network so what would happen is these computers were you could network these computers together with various technologies but um, there was no centralization, meaning each computer was equal. There was no computer that controls all the other computers. A network admin would have to, uh, if they wanted to make changes, they'd have to sit down at each and every computer to make those changes or get users to help them, which was always a nightmare. Um, and so that didn't, you know, it worked, but it didn't work very efficiently. All right. Now, as we moved into the 1990s, there was a, a company. That kept that was gaining ground called Novell, Novell, and they had a product called Netware, which was the idea of that was to use a server that would help manage uh, machines and also allow people to share files easier. Whereas in a peer-to-peer -peer network back originally, these machines would have to share files with each other, and people would have to know each other's passwords. It just didn't work very well. Well, eventually, with the creation of the file server concept, you had a more powerful machine that you could share files on and all that. And eventually Novell even came out with the idea of a server that could manage other machines. Now this is kind of where Microsoft comes in. Microsoft created their product called NT and they created this uh, concept of a domain controller which is a special type of server that can manage these other servers. Now fast forward they came out with what was known as a domain but fast forward to the year 2000 Microsoft releases their newest domain technology and they call it uh, Active Directory and Active Directory domains were represented by a triangle alright and a domain controller was a a server essentially that had a database on it and that database was the Active Directory database so let's just kinda fix that here this little cylinder looking thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent my Active Directory database so uh, AD alright um, and this was is what we still call to this day we call it ADDS Active Directory Domain Services and usually if you hear that term uh, Active Directory Domain Services it means it's an on-premise domain so anyway um, you would always want to have more than one domain controller you the reason you want to have more than one domain controller is because the same reason you have more than one of any type of, of server really one reason being um, to break up the disbursement of load these machines will authenticate with these domain controllers and the more machines you got uh, you know you don't want all of that just going to one domain controller right the other consideration is redundancy if you only have one and that server goes down well you're in trouble right so we want to have multiple the other thing about domain controllers that are interesting is that they replicate. So, uh, for example, let me make a, I'm going to make a little smiley face guy here, and this little smiley face guy is going to represent uh, my uh, user. 
So we create a user account on a domain controller. Now the interesting thing about user accounts, or the interesting thing really about domain controllers is that they replicate. So everything you do on one uh, will replicate over to the other. So if I create a user account on that first one, well, replication is gonna occur between uh, both of them. And so this little arrow thing I'm gonna make here is gonna represent replication. So domain controllers replicate. That means that this user could log on to any one of these thousands machine and it's gonna you know, authenticate with the uh, domain controller, all right? The authentication protocol that uh, is used is the protocol known as Kerberos, all right? Kerberos is the authentication uh, protocol. What is a protocol? It's like a language, basically, okay? Uh, now, there was an older protocol that, that, uh, that it also supported called NTLM. That was for legacy for older prior to the year 2000 machines. Now, the um, that protocol allowed us to have encrypted passwords and all that and authenticate securely and all that fun stuff. The other thing is, is Active Directory uses a language um, known as the Directory Service Language, and that language was called LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Now, all that is, again, this is all decades old at this point. Um, at the time when it came out, it was cutting edge, but it's, it is a bit dated nowadays. Uh, but it still works, and it's still pretty secure, though there are some considerations on security that I'm not going to explain right now. Now, the other thing that's important about Active Directory is that all machines have to have a name. And the name must be, of course, associated with an IP address and, and all of that. And so there is a service that we use that we use it on the Internet all the time called DNS, Domain Name Service. Our, our uh, domain must have a name. Usually when you name your domain, you would name it after your company, and a lot of people even name their domains based on their web presence. So, for example, my domain might be called examlabpractice.com. That's my company, my web presence. And um, I'm going to need to have a, a server in my domain that can associate the names and IP addresses together. So that server is called a DNS server. DNS, Domain Name System Server. And that server will also have to have a little database on it. And that database will be our DNS database. Okay. So we'll just draw another little cylinder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this, border it with red, and then I'm going to color code the database red, which means that this database, the DNS database, is associated with that name. Now what happens is our machines, clients, domain chores, we also might even have, let's, let's draw a file server over here. Pretty common that we have file servers in our environment. Okay, um, All of these machines would register with our DNS, all right? And this allows for the centralization of name resolution, meaning they register their IP addresses into this database, and then now, anytime a machine needs to find another machine, it can query DNS. So for example, these machines all have to authenticate by your domain controllers. They can query DNS and say, hey, DNS, do you know what the uh, address is of one of my domain controllers so I can authenticate? And DNS can reply back and say, yeah, here is the information. At that point, the client can go and authenticate. So it works very efficiently. Now, all of this together, this, this idea of domain controllers, this triangle you see here, this provides centralization. So we, we moved away from peer-to-peer -peer networking back in the day where you know, every machine was kind of its own boss and there was no centralized way of managing things to now we are working in a centralized environment. These domain controllers help us centralize. This DNS service help, helps us centralize. So we now have some central control over things. One of the great things about our uh, domain controllers too is we have these wonderful things called GPOs, group policy objects. A group policy object is this object that you can create that has all these settings, parameters, uh, you know, any type of attribute you want to configure or change on machines, you can do it through a GPO. So for example, if your boss walks up to you and says, hey, I want you to um, force the firewalls to be turned on all these machines. I want to make sure that the antivirus is always up to date. 
Uh, I want you to disable some of the, the wallpaper feature. I don't want people you uh, putting crazy wallpapers on their machine. Um, so, I mean, you could, the sky's the limit. There are literally thousands of things you can do inside of a GPO, but what happens is that GPO can instruct these machines to turn things on and turn things off. GPOs also replicate, so when you create a GPO on a domain controller, it replicates over to the other domain controller. So it doesn't matter which machines you know, authenticate with which domain controller. All right, so these GPOs can be deployed out to these machines, and this is how you turn things on, turn things off. You could even deploy software with that if you wanted to. So it was, a, it was very, very powerful, um, a very, very powerful system for managing everything. All right, uh, of course, let's let's throw the internet into the mix here. Let's say that this little cloud is going to represent the, uh, you know, the internet, and um, let's talk about kind of a little bit about how that sort of fits into the picture. Let me just clean it up here with the mighty stroke of my paintbrush. I will clean up the internet. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, so then we have the internet, right? So maybe we've got an internet connection that's coming in here. All right, and of course you don't want to just leave your internal network exposed, so your company would generally have a firewall, right? Um, and we would, we'll just put that firewall right here. And so now we have, um, you know, a secure way for traffic to flow out to the internet and uh, the only things that can come in would be things that we send out and we could allow things through that firewall if we want to. Now this is a traditional domain. This is the way we've done things for 20 years, all right? Um, and in this next little section I want to talk about uh, expansion on all of this and where where things have gone with things like RAS and all that and VPN and virtualization. So um, that'll wrap this little section up and we'll move on to the next. I now want to talk about some concepts that are also sort of the foundation of how we've done things over the years. It's important to understand how we've done things over the years so we can understand how uh, things are now. So looking back, we have an Active Directory domain, ADDS as it's called, Active Directory Domain Services, which uses the LDAP Lightweight Director Access Protocol, which uses Kerberos for authentication or for this older, for the legacy back in the 90s devices that used NTLM, a new technology land manager, which is, isn't all very new these days. But uh, even Kerberos is pretty old con uh, considering you know, we've been using it for, for decades, and I think actually the protocol even came out back in the 1980s. So, you know, so we got some data technologies, but the technologies have been updated, a lot of them over the years, to be secure. So you can still feel comfortable using those. But let's talk about some different scenarios now. Um, the first thing I want to look at is the scenario of what happens when we have a user who is not at the office. So this person is working from home. Working from home is a lot more popular nowadays than it has been in the past, so it's very common. And this person needs the ability perhaps to, you know, be able to connect in and access uh, services that are inside. Okay? Um, and we've got a file server, but, you know, ultimately we, we you probably are aware that, you know, in the past um, it was always this mindset of do it yourself, host your own server. So, you know, your companies might have, they might have a file server, but then they might also have a, um, you know, they might be, they might have a SQL database server that, that users need to access. Let's, let's create that SQL. All right. Um, maybe uh, Microsoft Exchange. That was email, right? Microsoft Exchange was, uh, you know, used for email, and then maybe even like SharePoint was very popular by Microsoft on-premise. So here you've got these, you know, these four servers providing a service to our devices, and um, you've got users working from home and everything else needing to get access to those. Let me just kind of move those a little bit over here, make a little bit of room here. 
and I'm going to shrink those down just a little bit as well. All right. So th this user who is working from home needs to access these services, but the person is not, uh, you know, not around. Well, let me tell you what you shouldn't do. You shouldn't just open up all the ports on the firewall and allow this person in to get access to these um, devices unsecurely. In fact, in the 90s, a lot of companies did that. The very first company I ever worked for uh, back in the 90s, they didn't really have a firewall, so you literally could share out your, you had a public address and uh, you could connect to it from home. It was really scary when I think about it. Even in the 90s, that was scary, but nowadays it's incredibly scary. Why is it scary? Because you got these people out there that want to do things that um, they shouldn't do and, and you know, get access to companies' data and, and try to do damage and ransom and all of that, ransomware and all that. And, and who are these people? Well, we, we generally call them hackers, right? So let me draw a little hacker. This, uh, this little, this little uh, box here is going to represent my hacker. All right, and let's make him let's make this hacker look like he's up to no good all right i'm just gonna i'm gonna give him like a let's give him like a devil horns some devil horns here and maybe like uh you know he's he's in a bad mood i'm gonna give him a frowny face and give him some fangs and maybe the fangs are dripping blood every okay no i'm just kidding <laughs> sorry sometimes i get carried away all right but uh anyway that's gonna be my hacker all right goofy looking little hacker person all right and um, so we don't want this hacker like spying on my user. We don't want this hacker getting access to resources inside. So how do we get around that? Well, usually the way we would do that is you would use a VPN, a virtual private network. So the way you would do that is you could purchase what was called a VPN concentrator. And basically it's a device that um, allows secure connections in. But in the Microsoft world, we actually had a type of server we could set up uh, called a RAS server or also known as an RAS server because it stood for routing and remote access services. But um, anyway, remote access services is the idea here. And with that, we have support for VPN. Now, what does that do? This allows this thing called a VPN tunnel to be created, which means that you have this encrypted communications that goes through to that RAS server. And then from there, that RAS server allows you to access other resources securely. This hacker will not be able to see the um, the traffic that's flowing through because it's all encrypted. The only thing the hacker would be able to see is that it was going up to this firewall and that would be it. Wouldn't be able to see what the traffic said. So this is how we would, we would definitely help secure things. Now, the other thing that I want to talk to you about here is what happens when a company needs to have a service that is exposed to the internet. For example, let's say that your company is going to host their own web server, okay? So you set up a web server, all right? Maybe this is gonna be www.examlabpractice.com or whatever, and people from the internet need to be able to get to it anonymously. Um, well, how are you gonna do that? Where are you gonna put that web server? Are you gonna put it internally? inside the domain like you see here. And the reason that's scary is because you'd have to open up port 443, port 80, which is the HTTP, HTTP ports to allow traffic to get in, which means not only could you know somebody out there on the internet anonymously get into this web server, but technically so could a hacker. And if a hacker was ever to gain access over this website by hacking it, then something called pivoting could occur where a hacker could actually gain access to these other services that are on your network. And so that's where things are really scary. So you definitely won't want to host it internally most of the time, although there was a way to do something called a reverse proxy. I won't get into that right now. But we would probably want to put this outside, right? So we'd want to put it out here. Um, but there's something else that's a problem on that. If you put it outside that firewall, you don't have to worry about, you know, people getting, you know, allowing traffic to come in. But the only that the scary thing about that is the fact that this poor web server is now completely exposed to the internet, so with no protection. So the way around that usually is people would get another firewall. So you'd have two firewalls. This first firewall was would be called the uh, internal connected firewall, and then you, this firewall here would be called the external connected firewall. Now this little network between that, we would call that a DMZ 
demilitarized zone, or now the more popular term is perimeter network. Okay, so DMZ perimeter network are basically the same thing. All right, um, and so now what you would do is you'd only open you would only open the ports like port 80, 443, 53 for DNS if you put DNS in there. Uh, whatever ports there that you need and now traffic would be able to get to this web server okay um, and so uh, even if a hacker you know somehow hacks this web server you're not going to allow traffic to pass through this firewall and get to these resources the only traffic that you might allow would be VPN okay um, and, and there's a bunch of authentication and all that that has to happen to make that work all right, so that's the idea of remote access and VPNs in a nutshell for you, as well as the concept of DMZ and uh, the perimeter network idea. Uh, now, the, the final thing I want to look at with you um, in this video is the idea of virtualization. So I talked about how in the past, uh, it was always the, the mindset was we got to host everything ourselves. We got to have our own little data center. We got to have our, you know, we got to have our own servers, file, server, SQL, Exchange, SharePoint, all that. And it's all got to be hosted by us. And that's the way things have always been done. All right. Um, now, uh, then what you'll find is, is as time went on, uh, a company called VMware came out with a uh, a way of expanding on virtualization. Just so you know, virtualization is not a new term. Virtualization has been around for a very long time. In fact, the term hypervisor is the essentially the software that lets us emulate hardware. And if you can emulate hardware, you can also store software on that emulated hardware. That's the idea of virtualization. Um, that term hypervisor has been around since the 1970s. The idea of even mainframes dividing up processing time and doing shared computing was a form of virtualization. So this is not a new concept, but VMware, they expanded on this idea and the and the, the thing that they did that really pushed the envelope on all this was that, hey, you don't necessarily need four different servers. And here's the other thing, here's the other crazy thing. If you wanted redundancy for those four servers, you'd really need eight servers, right? And you could do clustering those together. So you'd have eight servers to provide redundancy for those. But with, with uh, virtualization, I can set up a hypervisor server, one server, and, and, and virtualize those other servers. Now, in the Microsoft world, we call that Hyper-V. That is the, the software that does this, Hyper-V, hyper, Hypervisor. Uh, Microsoft's not the one that came up with that. VMware's not the first to ever come up with that. VMware was the biggest contributor to this concept, though, so I do have to give them credit where credit is due. All right, now the other beautiful thing, though, about this is you get a really, really powerful machine. You virtualize your um, machines on those. You get these things called um, checkpoints in Microsoft. They used to be called snapshots, and a lot of other companies still call them snapshots, where you can make changes without the worry of breaking anything because you can revert back to before the change was made. The other thing that's wonderful about um, using virtualization is if I want to com uh, have complete redundancy, I don't have to have eight servers. I could literally you know, purchase another server and have a copy of the virtual machines on that other server. Now I've only got two servers as opposed to having to have uh, a total of eight servers. Okay, so this is a very powerful feature capability that kind of uh, started everything. Another thing that we got, and, and this is kind of where you start thinking about cloud computing, is with virtualization comes the, the term elasticity, which basically means that each of these machines can be given a certain amount of RAM processing power. But here's what's interesting about that. If one of the servers isn't using all of the available RAM that it's been given, it can share it with other servers. So for example, this file server has been given more RAM than it needs and then SQL needs that RAM, the file server can give up some of that RAM over to SQL. And when SQL's done using that extra memory, it can release it back to everybody. It's basically a pool type scenario where it gets released into a pool of RAM and pool of CPU and they can grow and shrink as they need. And that's the, the, the small way of sort of uh, on-premise way of looking at elasticity. Of course, when you get into cloud computing, you'll learn that that can expand across multiple machines across the you know, the, the board in these big data centers. But 
not to get into that just yet here, but that's the idea. Hopefully that now helps you with understanding that concept of what virtualization is. And with that is really where, you know, cloud computing started to come into play, which I'm not explaining in this video, but hopefully now you have a much better understanding of the concept of, of the RAS VPN as well, the DMZ uh, concepts and virtualization. And now we'll, in this next section, we'll start getting into the concept of cloud services. So with the creation of virtualization, it got companies thinking, companies like Amazon and Google and Intel and IBM and eventually even Microsoft that, hey, we've got these massive data centers. Uh, why not? allow people to pay us to host their virtual machines on our data center. So in other words, we can get people to pay us money to host their virtual machines and they don't have to deal with all the headaches of dealing with everything on premise. So this is really the idea of where cloud services came from. And so I'm going to draw this kind of big cloud here. This is going to represent cloud computing, if you will. We'll have a connection coming down here, okay? And I will just kind of clean that up a little bit, make it somewhat look nice. So this being, you know, the big I, big thing is this is not an, a new concept of, if you think about humans as a whole, we have offered services for years. I know how to change the oil in my car, but I don't necessarily enjoy doing it. So I can pay a, uh, a mechanic shop um, the, the fee and they will do it for me as a service, right? Well, this is the idea of cloud services. So there's some acronyms I want to introduce you to, the first one being the term IAAS, and that is infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service means the cloud provider is offering their infrastructure for a fee as a service, okay? So the idea being something like this, instead of me having to host my virtual machines and all that in my on-premise environment, I can pay this cloud company to host virtual machines for me. They can also host a virtual network for you. They can host, uh, they can have storage that's uh, offered to you. They can have firewalls, virtual firewalls that are associated on those virtual networks and virtual load balancers, okay? They can have apps out there that are available. They can have virtual databases that are hosted in the cloud. So essentially just about anything you could imagine that you can host on premise can be hosted out there in the, the cloud service. Uh, now, Amazon, Google, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, these various companies offer this Microsoft's cloud service uh, that does this, their, their IAAS service is called Azure. Now, let me just kind of clarify, you may pronounce that name, that word a little different than I do, Azure or Azure or Azure. Actually, years ago when I was first learning Azure, I actually went to uh, the internet and started watching videos of the developers that created Azure and the first few developers that I watched, that's how they pronounced it. They pronounced it Azure. So that's how I just assumed that it needed to be pronounced. Of course, I learned later down the road that not all the developers even agree on how to pronounce that word. Some of them pronounced it Azure, Azure, uh, Azure. I've even heard somebody pronounce it Azure. So this is one of those tomato, tomato, pronounce that word any way you want to pronounce it. That's how I say it, which is Azure. Okay. So Azure is Microsoft's official um, inner infrastructure as a service. And the way that it all works is you pay a fee for what you use every month. Basically, how much CPU, memory, storage, network, all of that that you use, that's what you're going to pay for. Okay, now there are some other terms, uh, other uh, acronyms that I want to introduce you to. There is an acronym called PAAS, which stands for Platform as a Service, and an acronym called SAAS, which is Software as a Service. Now, the, uh, the, uh, the idea there being that there are, well, we'll start with, uh, with Software as a Service first. 
software as a service, the idea is that there is a fully functional app or application that is 100% ready for you to start using or your users to start using. All you got to do is just jump right in and start using it. Okay, so there are some uh, Azure services that are software as a service. There's also what are called platforms as a service. Now, platform as a service is kind of a, uh, there's a little bit more work involved from an admin standpoint. So a platform as a service means there is a some type of software platform that is available for you to start using and it's 100% ready for you to use, but you have to go and administer it and use it before it's going to really do anything. Uh, a good example of this is Microsoft's directory services in the cloud is called Intra-ID. Intra-ID. All right which I want to make, it's very important that you realize that this was formally called Azure AD and there's still a lot of documentation out there that refers to this as Azure AD. So it's very important that, uh, that you are aware of that. Now you are taking my course right now and you should realize that um, I have hundreds of hours of videos that still may, that I've, I've got to update that involve that term Azure AD. There are literally hundreds of hours that I have recorded using the term Azure AD and I'm in the process of updating videos but be aware that I don't have them all upgraded. So you may hear me refer in the course to stuff as Azure AD. I actually have a video on this for you to watch after these foundation videos. It's a video that says do not skip. So please do not skip that video. Make sure you watch that video because it's going to talk about this name change. So anyway, the name is now Intra ID. It's just a name change. They changed it to Azure AD. The services are pretty much all the same. It's just a name change. Okay, so Intra ID is a platform as a service. Now it is Microsoft's directory services. This is where your user accounts and passwords and groups and permissions, role permissions and all that are all managed through Intra ID, formerly Azure AD, okay? Um, whereas on premise in a domain, we called it ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services. All right, I think that's part of the reason Microsoft changed the name to kind of distinguish the difference between the on-premise uh, Active Directory and the former Active Directory, Azure AD, to Intra ID. Anyway, um, this platform as a service is ready for you to use, but there's only like one user, and that's the admin, and then you're responsible for going in there as an admin and adding users and controlling things. That's why it's a platform as a service. It's not... 100% ready uh, set up. You have to administer it. Now, Microsoft's main uh, platform as a service uh, functions and software as a service, they have something called Microsoft 365. So there's really two parts to the Microsoft Cloud Service. There's Azure, uh, which is mostly focused on the IaaS side things. And don't get me wrong, in Azure there are also some platform as a services and software as a services, but it's mostly geared towards IaaS. Whereas Microsoft 365 is mostly geared towards platform as a service. Now these two are very related. Microsoft 365 sits on top of Azure. You can't have Microsoft 365 without Azure. And if you create an Azure account, then it'll allow you to automatically create a Microsoft 365 account. So these are all related. You're not just going to create an Azure account or not just going to create a Microsoft 365 account. They're pretty much linked together. Okay. Now, in the Microsoft 365 services, you have lots of platform as a services and software as a, as a service. For example, uh, we have the what are called the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, which that was formerly called Office 365, and that's the downloadable version of off the, the Microsoft 365 apps, formerly the Office 365 apps like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, all of that. And there is also something called Office for the web. Now that is fully a software as a service. The, uh, the Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise, that is actually a mix. It's a platform as a service and a software as a service. Most people refer to it as a software as a service because they're downloadable apps. But as an admin, from an admin standpoint, we have to administer that. So the administration side of it is platform as a service. Uh, Office for the web is 100% software as a service. These are web-based versions of the Office apps that are ready for you, for your users to use. They get Once they get a license, they can use it. Okay, then we have 
exchange online. Okay, so the administration side of that is a platform as a service, but the user side of that is a software as a service, right? And then we've got SharePoint online, which is the same idea. It's a, you know, admin side is a platform as a service, but the user side, which is what most everybody focuses on, is a uh, software as a service. We have Microsoft Teams, same thing for that, okay? Um, you know, for, for messaging and, and all of that fun stuff, we have... Uh, a product called Intune, which is an incredibly powerful product, uh, mobile device management, mobile uh, application management. Intune is what is sort of taking the place of GPOs in the cloud. So on premise, we could control the settings and parameters and attributes, and we could deploy software and all that using GPOs on premise. Well, now when it comes to the cloud service, we can use Intune. We can actually control on premise machines from Intune. So it is very, very powerful, an incredibly powerful product. Then we've got we've got OneDrive for Business. OneDrive for Business is a cloud-based storage that users can have access to. So anyway, there there's actually so many products that are cloud-based products. There's no way I could put them all in here, but here's some of the main, you know, main things. Now, as far as the licensing and, and all of that, with Azure you are paying for what you use, CPU, RAM, storage, and network. But for the Microsoft 365 services, you have what are called subscriptions, and you purchase a subscription with a certain amount of licenses. So if, for example, if I purchase a Microsoft 365 subscription, I can purchase a certain amount of licenses, and I can issue those out to my users, and I will pay a monthly fee for however many licenses that I've got with my subscription. Okay, and that's just a, a giving you a basic understanding of how that works exactly. Okay, so ultimately, though, if I could kind of color code this, uh, we'll say that, you know, the, the Azure side of this, IaaS, and again, Azure does have some platform as a service stuff as well as software as a service, but it's mostly geared to be a I, uh, infrastructure as a service. And then the uh, Microsoft 365 is mostly platform as a service, software as a service. So if I was to kind of draw a... Um, you know, kind of just draw around these, we would say that the these right here are all geared towards Microsoft 365. And then this, these are geared towards the infrastructure service, which is Azure. And both of these, Azure and Microsoft 365, they share intra-ID. They share intra-ID, okay? Yellow, or uh, red and blue make purple, right? <laughs> okay. So they actually, um, you create users in the Azure side or the Microsoft 365 side, you're going to see the same users because they are linked together. They share the same directory service. So it's important to understand that. Now, the other piece of this is what about situations where you want to link all this together? So it's not uncommon nowadays for companies, you know, to have this triangle, to have this uh, on-premise domain, and then also start utilizing Microsoft's cloud services. Um, and then, you know, in the for years and years, they've always pushed this thing called SSO. SSO is single sign-on, where you have a, a user has a user account, and that user account gives them access to everything they need. Well, we don't get SSO if you have to have a user account to access things in your domain and then a different user to access things in the cloud, right? Well, Microsoft has ways around that. They actually have uh, services that you can use for linking these together. And that service, let me just kind of move some of this around a little bit so I can make a little bit more room. We'll put the DNS server there. We'll move this little RAS server down over here. And the server is called Intra Microsoft Intra Connect. And it was formally formally Azure AD Connect. Okay. So then so again it's called Intra Connect now and it used to be called Azure AD Connect. And um, I'm definitely I, I like to refer to it with the old name as well, just because be advised you really kind of need to know the old name as well, because there's still a lot of documentation that will refer to this as the older name. The newer name is IntraConnect. The the older name is is uh, Azure AD Connect. But this was a server you could set up on premise, and what it would do is it'll synchronize your user accounts 
out to the cloud. So your on-premise user accounts would get synchronized. So whatever users you have on-premise, and you don't have to synchronize them all, you could pick and choose which one you synchronize, but your user accounts are gonna sync out to intra-ID. And now what'll happen is, you have this thing called seamless SSO, where when your users log on to the domain, it logs them on in both places. They log on to the on-premise domain as well as in the cloud, which is really, really cool. Now that is a heavier weight version. There is actually a, um, a lighter weight version that's a very, very lightweight application. You don't actually have to dedicate a server to it like they kind of want you to with Inter uh, Connect. There is actually another lighter weight tool called uh, IntraSync or IntraID Sync, which is a lighter weight. Now there's some pluses and minuses to go in either route, which I'm not gonna get into right now, but the uh, the traditional way to do this was to use uh, this here, IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect. Now the other thing I'll tell you is this does not sync back. So it would sync users out, but it won't sync users that are created out in the cloud back to on-premise. You cannot currently do that. You can't synchronize users that are created in intra ID down here but any users can be synced out and it'll even make it where if they change their password like out in the cloud it'll it'll sync that as well so anyway that kind of gives you a, a rundown of that now I'll also tell you that Microsoft is moving away from domains in fact if you um, if, if you've got an on-premise domain like like what you see here, then yeah, it's a great idea to, to utilize this. But if you're a new company, and this really pains me to say it because I have um, fed my family for over two decades by, by not only teaching about Active Directory on-premise, but also implementing Active Directory on-premise as a consultant. Um, and so it kind of pains me to say this, but as a consultant now, I'm not even recommending that newer companies implement a domain anymore. Um, a lot of companies are now moving to the cloud and there's ups and downs of that. But to be honest with you, in most cases, your co a company gets out cheaper by utilizing uh, cloud services, okay? Um, and so nowadays you can actually set up on-premise machines and manage them through Intune and things like that that are in the cloud. You can even have client machines hosted in the cloud, but I'm not gonna dive into that right now. Uh, ultimately though, if you are a company that's been around for a while, then the traditional approach that you see here where you've got a, a domain um, and then you're starting to move into the cloud, you can set up IntraConnect, formerly Azure AD Connect, uh, or Intra ID Sync, and, which is the lighter weight version, and you can have things synchronized out to the cloud. All right. All right, well, hopefully these foundation videos have been instruct, instructional to you. I hope you got a lot out of this and you're ready to move on. I'd like to spend some time now talking about mailbox databases. Now, mailbox databases are one of your key ingredients in Microsoft Exchange. Microsoft Exchange is going to be storing uh, all of the different mail that users are going to be receiving, inbound, outbound mail, into what is called a mailbox database. Now, this is nothing new. Uh, if you've been around with Exchange for a long time, you might know that they've called these mailbox databases. Of course, in the early days of Exchange, they used to call them mailbox stores, uh, and then they now, now call them mailbox databases or mailbox database stores. So uh, what is a mailbox database? It's a, it's a logical object. It's a unit that's stored on a hard drive into a database file, and that database file is called an EDB file. All right, um, And these EB, EDB files are now not only for mailbox databases you're going to see also these these actually store public folders now as well so it used to be in the early days of exchange 2 we'd have to create a separate public folder database from our mailbox database now microsoft has pretty much just merged all these things together okay uh, so you have a bunch of different kinds of files that are going to be involved in the in the mailbox database as well and another thing you can do is each mailbox database in Exchange 2016 and 2019 uh, has its own properties. So we're gonna look at how we can configure some of the different rules and capabilities of each one of these databases. And you'll actually be doing that, you can do that with the graphical tool, the, uh, the EEAC, which is the Exchange Administrative Center, or you can use the EMS, which is Exchange Management Shell, which of course is PowerShell, right? Now, what are the different files that you've got involved here? You have uh, the mailbox database itself is called an EDB file. That's going to be the main file 
that stores your mailbox information, right? You've also got a transaction log file, or actually you have a lot of transaction log files that get created over a period of time. Uh, if you're not familiar with transaction logs and databases, uh, one thing that's interesting about transaction logs, you're going to find that transaction logs actually store information before it actually makes its way to a database. So uh, information will be written to the transaction log and then it'll get written to the database. I'm going to draw all this out for you here in a second so you'll you'll see where I'm going with that. Another thing that comes into play is called a checkpoint file. The checkpoint file keeps track of the uh, tasks that are being written to the log into the database and it confirms what has been committed from the log into the database. This is really helpful in a situation where uh, imagine a, a scenario where the exchange server was in the middle of doing something and it committed it to the log and it was about to commit it to the database when all of a sudden the power went out on the server. Okay, maybe you had a UPS hooked up to the server, but the UPS failed, battery was dead or something, and the power goes out all of a sudden, and you could end up with corrupted data or you could end up missing data or something like that. Well, what happens is, is your checkpoint file keeps track of what's been written to the log, what's been written to the database, and the great thing about that is if, uh, if something wasn't committed to the database and the server went down or whatever, it got committed to the log, as soon as the server comes back online, it can go into the log and check the checkpoint file and say, uh-oh, I didn't get to commit this to the database yet. So then it would commit it to the database and uh, check it off in the checkpoint file. Okay. Another file you've got is the temporary file. The temp file is going to store things that are being written uh, in, in a temporary memory space while things are happening. So this is just a, a file that's basically helping you process things through. It, it's handling everything up in memory as it's writing to the log and to the database. The, the last set of files you've got, these are called reserve log files. And you'll notice they always start with an E and then there'll be a number and then an RES and 000, 001, so on and so forth. And these take up a certain amount of hard drive space just in case you were to run out of hard drive space. Imagine what would happen if we were right in the middle of doing something like we had a bunch of email flowing in and then all of a sudden the uh, hard drive ran out of space, okay? And, and then what ends up happening is the server cannot commit the information that's supposed to be written to the hard drive because it runs out of space. So you have a couple of these reserve log files and what they do is you have a couple for every database and what they do is they've already conserved a certain amount of memory in that way or a certain amount of hard drive space and that way if you were to run out of hard drive space the server can go ahead and finish writing down what it needs to write down into those log files, those JRS log files, JRS and log files. And what happens there is after it's written to those log files, because they've take they already have reserved the space on the hard drive, it can shut the database down and not allow anybody to write anything until you free up some hard drive space. Okay. So this is what your reserve log files do. They can they already are taking up a certain amount of space and that way um, you know that that space is already reserved and uh, the the changes that are being made even if the hard drive runs out of space it can go ahead and commit those changes okay now the other thing I want to say is that you really shouldn't have to mess with these files a whole lot you really shouldn't have to change these files a lot the at most the only thing you're really going to want to care about is just making sure stuff is backed up okay uh, especially to not just your database but your transaction logs because believe it or not you can actually uh, recover your database from your transaction logs. Everything that is written in the database is written in your transaction logs and basically those logs if you lost your database you can replay those logs and have that database recreated. Okay. Alright, so what I want to do now is I want to sort of walk through actually uh, what the steps are that are actually happening with the database. I'm just going to kind of draw that out for you now. We'll start with we got an exchange server here and we're going to call this EX1. So our exchange server 1 here and Exchange Server 1 is receiving, received a message, okay? So PC email being flowing in through the, the client uh, transport services, client access role, okay? And so from there, coming into your, your email server, uh, your email server has now got to commit that to the database. So there's going to be a few things that have to happen, all right? So uh, first thing that's going to happen here is it's got to write the message. Where is it going to write the message? 
it's going to write the message to two places. Okay, the message is going to get written into what's called memory cache, so it's going to go into RAM, right? So it can be processed, and this is going to be part of the temporary uh, file we talked about. And then from there, it's also going to be written to the transaction log. So the transaction log again is going to get this before the database ever gets it. Okay. And then after it's written successfully to the transaction log, at that point, that's when it's actually going to make its way into the database. Okay. So step three here is it's actually going to get written to the database. Let me just kind of draw a little database symbol here. This is going to be my mailbox database that I've got. All right. And that's, of course, going to be your little EDB file and all that. So this is our mailbox database, mailbox DB. All right. And of course, if you've got DAGs and all that, DAGs will play a role in this. That gets into database availability groups, which we're going to cover, you know, the concepts of DAGs uh, coming up a little bit later. All right. But it, it gets committed to the database. Now, the other thing that happens after that also, the other thing we have to think about is the checkpoint file. So we have a, a checkpoint file. All right. We'll say CHK checkpoint. And it's got to update that checkpoint file and confirm that both the transaction log and your um, your database have both gotten the information in it. Okay, so that is going to be the fourth thing that happens. Now, finally, after all that's occurred, uh, at that point, a client can actually receive that information. So, at that point, somebody could be using Outlook. They could use Outlook on the web whatever and your user can actually check their email get their email and uh, access that so um, that whole process kind of start to finish is happening you know on your exchange server writing to the cache transaction log it goes into the database updates the checkpoint file and then at that point somebody who wants to check their email can actually get the email so outlook could actually receive the email but that is not going to happen outlook's not going to receive that email until that uh, checkpoint file uh, has been updated and confirmed everything's gone through successfully. Okay, so that's sort of your start to finish there between uh, uh, receiving the email on the Exchange server and committing it down to the to the hard drive of the database and then allowing a client to get it. Okay, so if you looked at the the previous lesson, uh, you saw the concepts of databases and how databases interact with uh, transaction logs and all that. I want to talk about the considerations now for database logs and all that. So. Uh, first things first, we know that when you make changes, the changes occur to the database and transaction log first before they get committed to the actual database. And the checkpoint file is going to help mark that the change has been made. Your log files themselves are about a megabyte piece, one mega piece. So, um, you know, it's it's storing the, the information, all the text, everything goes into that log. The, the transaction did occur and was written to the database and it just keeps continually creating more transaction logs as time goes on. So as that one meg fills up, it creates another log, it adds another number to it. Okay. Um, so it's, and, and we'll take a look, I'll show you the files here coming up, but the, the, it just keeps adding more numbers and you get more logs. It does not delete the logs automatically. Okay. Um, you 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 definitely don't want to usually just delete all of your logs because remember that you can recover your database from your logs okay so some of the other considerations there is you should definitely try to keep things backed up you can keep your database backed up you can keep your logs backed up it is not as critical to keep your logs backed up if you are using what is called a DAG a DAG is a database availability group coming up we're gonna have a big lesson on that we're gonna talk about how DAGs are sort of the pr premier way of providing redundancy for our databases in Exchange and has been over the last few uh, versions of Exchange. Okay, so DAGs are huge, important capability that's going to give us redundancy. Uh, and of course, if we're using DAGs and we've got a large amount of redundancy for our databases, then we don't necessarily have to, to constantly keep our transaction logs backed up or on a you know dedicated place. Um, you can move them, though, if you want. You can move your logs to a different place and put them on solid state or something to get a little bit better performance. But it's not as critical if you've got DAGs that we uh, have to keep all of those logs backed up all the time. You've also got transaction logs uh, that can be placed using RAID. So if you're using a redundant RAID independent disk, if you want some extra fault tolerance, you can store that on a RAID disk as well. Okay. 
The big thing too, though, is you know these these are one meg files, and they just keep adding more files over time. You got to make sure you have enough disk space to handle that. And the other thing is, do not implement any kind of compression for those logs. Okay, anytime you're dealing with database technologies and all that. If you're dealing with transaction logs, I don't care if it's Exchange, I don't care if it's SQL, I don't care what it is, you should never use compression with those. Uh, when you back up data somewhere off of the server, it's okay to use compression then, but not with the actual live versions of those files. Okay, now as far as storage options in Exchange for storing your database, for storing your logs, there's different options. The, the two main options people go with is DAS or SAN, okay? So what is DAS? DAS is direct attached storage, okay? Chances are you are probably sitting in front of a computer right now that uses DAS. DAS is simply a hard drive that's attached to your computer, okay? Or multiple hard drives that are attached to your computer. Now, um, this is a very low-cost solution because, you know, uh, hard drives, you know, are really relatively inexpensive. Uh, unless you go with the higher end solid state stuff, it's probably already built into your computer. Most servers you buy, you price it out, it's going to come with hard drive space and all that, already going to come with hard drives. Uh, it's easy to implement because, well, most of the time it's already there. Uh, and the other consideration is they tell you there's distributed failure points. So this is where you run into a problem with DAS. Um, and you can actually use RAID and all that to provide redundancy, but if the whole server fails or something, you're in trouble at that point, right? So uh, if you really, really want high availability, uh, they, they recommend using a storage area network. Now, the downside to a storage area network is that's where things get pricey, okay? Uh, you can go with name brand like Fiber Channel. You're going to pay a lot of money for Fiber Channel equipment. Uh, another option is to use iSCSI, which is a, a more a less expensive than, than Fiber Channel. And actually, you can get about the same performance in a lot of cases with iSCSI that you can get with Fiber Channel. But the idea of a storage area network is I can have equipment that is distributed in different places. I can have my, my uh, storage in my server room uh, stored in a different place even than where my servers are. It can run off fiber. You can even have your storage stored in a different office altogether if you want. You can have multiple servers that are accessing the same storage. And that way you've got uh, a good failover solution if servers fail or if the cables, something happens to your fiber cable. Even if the storage fails, you can provide redundancy for all that. So the goal of a SAN, of a storage area network, is it's a, it's a separate network that is built specifically to provide high availability for your storage, okay? Uh, now, I want to introduce you to a new, a new feature that they've added. This is an Exchange 2019 feature only. We did not have this with uh, Exchange 2016 or below. Uh, it's called MCDB, Metacache Database. And the Metacache Database is a feature that lets you take advantage of solid state. If you put solid state drives in your machines, you can actually uh, utilize this MCDB feature. And what it does is it, it's an indexing feature where it, it, uh, it indexes the information inside of a database to give you a higher throughput in locating data inside that database, all right? So you get a, a lower performance cost. It reduces the CPU overhead by indexing all of your data and storing it over on a solid state drive. So it uses less memory. They tell you it actually gives you two 50% faster search and log on information uh, processes that actually occur. You get better IOPS, input outputs, per second with that. They tell you it can be two to three times faster uh, with your mail access, okay? Um, and, and, you know, percentage-wise, as far as um, the user load itself, they tell you that you're going to have 20% more uh, user load on the same server as compared to previous versions of Exchange. So this can be a really great feature that can be implemented to uh, give you better performance out of your databases. Okay, now another thing we've got is we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be demonstrating all of this, by the way, here coming up. We're going to look at creating and managing databases. And uh, of course, there's multiple ways to do that. One being the graphical way, which is the Exchange Management Center, which is the EAC. And then the other way would be to use the PowerShell method, which is going to be EMS, right? Um, now, again, and, and this has sort of been, it, been the way it has been ever since Exchange 2007 came out, 
um, the graphical tool cannot do the more advanced things. The more advanced capabilities in Exchange is going to require you to use the uh, management shell for that. So it kind of forces you to learn PowerShell whether you want to or not. You're going to be using that EMS a, a good bit. Okay. One of the things right out of the gates they tell you you can't do is you can't use the EAC to move mailbox databases. So if you want to do that, you have to learn uh, the Exchange Management Shell command. So we're going to look at some of those PowerShell commands coming up. Here's uh, just four common ones that people use. You have new mailbox database, new dash mailbox database, which is going to let you create a mailbox database if you want. Get mailbox database, uh, which is going to let you see all the mailbox databases you have in Exchange. You have set dash mailbox database, which is going to let you modify the parameters of that database, change uh, information about that database. And then finally, there's the one we were just talking about, the move dash, uh, move dash database path. Okay, which of course is going to let you move a mailbox database. So all in all, you can see um, that there's a lot here that involves databases. We're going we're gonna to definitely get into uh, how to do that graphically using the EAC and PowerShell, and I'm going to walk through all that with you guys coming up in these, uh, in these next sections. I'd like to talk now about using iSCSI in order to accommodate your database store. So we, we, we spoke a little bit about I, uh, iSCSI in my previous lecture, and I, I talked about storage area networks and how we can store our information somewhere else. We don't actually have to store our mailbox database on our Exchange server, which can be very convenient if you've got a couple of servers that have a large amount of data. Now, you can go full-blown fiber channel uh, and, and use all fiber channel of proprietary equipment, fiber channel switches, and fiber optic cable. But Microsoft actually has a, a relatively inexpensive solution for companies that, that really can't afford to go to that level of, of hardware. So what you can actually do is you could get yourself a couple of file servers and uh, implement what's known as an iSCSI target and your Exchange server can utilize those file servers for its mailbox database storage. Okay, And you can have a nice uh, backup solution for that uh, and all of that going. So I want to just kind of explain this concept to you. Uh, I'm going to draw it out for you. And of course, uh, iSCSI is something that can pop up on the exam. So understanding uh, how it works is, is important for that as well. OK, so um, to start with, you're, you're going to need, we're going to use a couple of servers here. OK. Uh, and the first server is going to be a file server. And that file server has got a lot of storage in it. So you have connected, uh, you know, lots of hard drive space, okay? Hard disk drive space or solid state, either way. You know, ideally solid state because you're going to get a lot of performance out of that, right? So you're going to have lots and lots of space on this drive available for the storage of Exchange databases. Okay, uh, We are going to install a role called the iSCSI target, uh, which uh, this is the, the file and storage services role is going to accommodate a feature role service called iSCSI target. And that iSCSI target is going to be the connection that is going to happen between your Exchange server and the iSCSI uh, target server, which is going to be your file server. Okay. Uh, now, granted, guys, you could use a NAS for this as well. If you went out and purchased uh, some NAS equipment, you could use that instead. But Microsoft's iSCSI target service is free of charge. It is part of the deal. You buy a server, you license a server, you get iSCSI target as part of the deal. Okay. So I'm going to have a server 2019 box here. All right. And uh, I'm going to install the iSCSI target service on that box. Okay, now granted, it doesn't have to be server 2019. Uh, you can go all the way back to like server 2008 R2, I believe, and, and be an iSCSI target server. But in my case, I'm using Windows Server 2019. And then, of course, we have our Exchange server. Okay, so this is going to be our Exchange server. Uh, in this case, EX1, our Exchange server. All right, and we want to store our mailbox database over on that iSCSI target server. Now, to do this, okay, you got to have connectivity between the uh, the two computers. So, you can have some kind of a network switch, and of course, in a in a perfect world, we would have fiber optic, right? So, 
you know, you'd want to use like fiber optic cable connecting it. Do you have to have fiber optic? Absolutely not. You do not have to have fiber optic, but of course you're going to get the best performance if you do, right? Okay, so, um, and you can even have two NICs and two fiber optic, and you can actually have um, uh, a NIC teaming for redundancy on your NICs. You can do a bunch of things there, okay? But um, now, the next thing that's got to happen is, once I've got my iSCSI target set up, okay, uh, the iSCSI target is is going to set up something called a V-disk, okay, a virtual disk, okay, and that V-disk, that virtual disk is where EX1 is actually going to store its data, okay, the V-disk could actually span multiple hard drives if you wanted, even, okay, Microsoft has a, a solution called storage spaces where you can span as many hard drives as you want, you can do what's called just a bunch of disk, if you've, if you've heard of that before, where you have a bunch of disks plugged into your server and you have a bunch of space that's that's spanning all those disks, you could set it up in a RAID format. Uh, you know, I could do what's called parity, which is like RAID 5. I can do mirroring. So you can actually set a bunch of stuff up on that server and provide redundancy, fault tolerance for this data, okay? Uh, granted, as I've said before, if we've got multiple exchange servers, we can use a DAG, which is a database availability group, which is going to give us redundancy as well. And again, I am going to talk about DAGs pretty thoroughly coming up here a little bit later. We'll go into all the concepts there as well as what you need to know for the test and all that good stuff, okay? Um, now, this server, this exchange server, okay, exchange, in this case, it's going to be exchange uh, 2019, but it really doesn't matter. It could be an earlier version of exchange as well. Um, iSCSI has been around for a while now but I'm going to be using Exchange 2019. This is going to be called the iSCSI Initiator. Now that is something that's very important. You need to be aware of that. The, the Exchange server is the thing connecting to the target. The Exchange server is the initiator and the server on the other end, the file server on the other end that's hosting the data is going to be the, uh, the iSCSI target. So make sure you get that straight in your head. If you're taking the exam, they're going to expect you to know the Exchange server would be the initiator, and then the server on the other end that's hosting the storage is going to be the, uh, the target server, okay? Okay, now, keep it in mind that if you wanted to, you could go to a whole other level, okay? You could have multiple servers, multiple switches, multiple fiber optic cables, and you could go all full-blown into providing yourself with a very, very redundant storage area network, okay? All right. So what I'm going to be doing now in this next little section is I'm actually going to demonstrate setting up iSCSI so that we can host our mailbox databases over here on this server. Now in my little lab environment, in my lab environment, this server here is going to be nyc-dc1. He's going to be my uh, file server. Now he is a DC and ordinarily in the real world I wouldn't use a DC, but for my lab environment I'm going to use my domain controller. He's going to be my file server. Okay. And of course, in my lab environment, my exchange server is nyc-ex1. So you're going to see me set up the, uh, the domain controller with the iSCSI target coming up here, and then the exchange server is going to be my iSCSI initiator. So hopefully this gives you a good foundation of how this is all going to connect, and uh, in, in this next little section, I'm going to set it up. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to be setting up my iSCSI services in order to accommodate my mailbox databases that I'm going to be creating in the later lessons, okay? So um, we're here on NYCDC1. This, this is going to be my Server 2019 machine that is going to be the file server that's going to play the role of what is called the iSCSI target, okay? So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Server Manager, okay? So we're going to open up Server Manager. We're going to go to the Manage menu option and we're going to click Add Roles and Features. Okay. Okay. Once we get in there, let me just kind of zoom in on that for you so you can see it a little bit better here. Uh, and we're going to click Next. And we're going to go to the screen by clicking Next that involves roles. And you'll see that we actually already have the file and storage services uh, role is installed, which we need that role, but we're missing something. If we expand that out, we'll see we have file and iSCSI services and then what we need to do is scroll down and we need this guy right here called the iSCSI target server okay so that is the role that we need to install in order to get all this up and running our our, our domain controller is going to be our target he's the one that's going to actually hold 
the the virtual disk that is going to store all of our mailbox database information okay so we're going to go ahead and click next through this and then we're going to install and uh, i'll pause the video real quick and then it'll be done installing okay so as you can see it's now done i'm going to go ahead and hit close we're going to zoom back out here and now that that is done installing i'm going to look here on the left side of the screen and i'm going to click on file and storage services and then you'll see that I have iSCSI also written here on the left side of the screen. So we'll click on iSCSI. All right. And once we get into iSCSI, you're going to notice that I do not have any iSCSI virtual disk at the moment. And of course, I need to generate a virtual disk so that the Exchange server can uh, connect to it and store its mailbox database. Okay. So I'm going to click right here. There's a little hyperlink that tells you. Uh, to create an iSCSI virtual disk, start the new wizard. So we're going to go ahead and click the, click on that. All right. And as you can see, it's going to bring this little wizard up. It's going to go ahead and confirm that I don't already have some existing disk. It's checking to see if any of that's out there. And then once that's done, I'm going to be able to go through the process of creating the disk. All right. Here we go. As you can see, it's saying that I've got all this space available on my C drive. If I had another hard drive in here, if I wanted to use another hard drive like a solid state drive or something like that, I could point to it. Uh, I'm just going to use the C drive. I've got 82 gigs uh, available, which is plenty for what I'm demonstrating here. But if I had another drive in the, in the computer, I could use it if I wanted to. But I'm going to choose the C drive. I'm going to click Next. And then at that point, it's going to ask me to give this, uh, give this disk a name. Okay, So um, I'm just going to call this VDisk1. All right, which is going to be the uh, the disk where this mailbox database is going to be stored. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and click next, and then I want to specify how big uh, I want this disk to be. Okay, so I can give this the amount of space that I want. I'm just going to do we'll do 60 gigs. We'll leave a little bit of space, and then I can choose to do a fixed disk, a dynamically expanding disk, or a differencing disk. Okay, now uh, a fixed disk is actually a disk where if I give, if I dedicate 60 gigs to this virtual disk, it is going to consume, immediately consume 60 gigs on this hard drive, okay? And the drive is not going to, it's not going to go past 60 gigs or any of that. It's just going to take up exactly 60 gigs right now on this drive, okay? Um, that is actually the recommended of these three options this is the recommended way to do it you're going to get the best performance out of your disk if you do fixed disk you have dynamically expanding now dynamically expanding makes it where it tells you that it's going to use 60 gigs but it's not actually going to consume 60 gigs until it needs it it basically grows so the disk will grow if you were only storing 10 gigs worth of data it's only really going to consume 10 gigs worth of data okay so that's that's fine and it would grow a differencing disk uses what's known as a parent disk and it ends up being uh, it works kind of like a, a checkpoint differencing disks are for lab testing and things like that if you had a parent disk and you didn't want to make any changes to the parent disk and there was some data on that parent disk and you didn't want to make changes to it it'll create a child disk and it'll make the changes to the child disk Okay, we're not going to, this has got the worst performance of all. This is used in just testing environments. Uh, in my case, I'm actually going to go with dynamically expanding, okay, because I don't really want to cons uh, consume all that space on my hard drive right now. Uh, but in the real world, it's better to go with fixed, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and click next. The next thing is it's telling me, it says assign this high SCSI virtual disk to an existing iSCSI target to create a new target for it. I don't have any targets yet. The domain controller, my file server, is going to be my target. So I'm going to click Next to create a new one. It says, okay, what do you want to name it? I'm going to call the, uh, the name of the target is going to be NYC-DC1, which is going to be the name of my server. Okay, I'm going to click Next. Now I've got to specify who the initiator is. Okay, So the initiator is going to be the Exchange server. So I'm going to click Add. All right, and at that point, it's going to want me to identify that initiator. So let's zoom back in on that. And um, you can identify initiator various ways. If you're using a query initiator computer ID, this is going to be a, a computer that identifies itself already as iSCSI. But really the easiest way to do it is just to identify it either by the DNS name or the IP address. I'm going to do it by IP address. 
So the Exchange server's IP address is 192.168.0.11, okay? So we're gonna use that, we're gonna click OK. There's the address, we're gonna click Next. Now we could, if we wanted to, we could put in a, a password and it would use an encrypted password. And of course in the real world, it might be a good idea for you to actually set up a, a username password for it to authenticate. And that makes it where the Exchange server has to authenticate with the target when it's uh, communicating. And this is just sort of a way to guarantee there's not like a man in the middle attack going on or or any of that but for speed and time purposes I'm just gonna I'm not gonna select that right now I'm gonna click next and it's gonna confirm that I've got everything the way I want it I'm gonna go ahead now and click to create and we'll uh, we'll, uh, we'll wait on this to get done okay so as you can see it's now done and I'm gonna go ahead and hit close and I officially now have my virtual disk set up okay and it's ready to go. All I gotta do now is go to my Exchange server and connect into it, okay? So we're gonna jump over now to the Exchange server. So as you can see, I'm now on my NYC EX1, which is my Exchange server, okay? We got, got Exchange installed, everything's set up. As you can see, I'm gonna come here now to Server Manager. We're gonna go to the Tools menu, and you're gonna notice that I don't have to install anything to get the iSCSI initiator. The iSCSI initiator is already available as a tool on server when you install it. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that, and it's gonna pop a message up on my screen that tells me that the iSCSI service is not running on this machine. So I need to go ahead and click yes, and it's gonna go ahead and start that uh, service up on the machine. All right, now what I've got to do is I've actually got to connect from this initiator, the exchange server, to the iSCSI target, which is going to be the NYC DC1 file server, okay? So we're going to go up here, we're going to put the uh, address, and I could put a DNS name or I could put an address in. The address of the target, which is the DC1 server, is 192.168.0.10. So I'm going to say quick connect, and it has detected the target on that NYC DC1 server. So it has detected the service, and I'm gonna go ahead and click Done, all right? And at that point, I'm gonna click OK, and guess what? It's now done, it's now connected. So what I'm gonna now do is show you that hard drive that's, that I'm connected to. I'm gonna hit Tools, and I'm gonna go into this tool called Computer Management, all right? So it's gonna pop computer management up on the screen here and then I'll be able to show you uh, disk management as well. All right, here we are. And we have a tool inside computer management called disk management, okay? So here's disk management right here. I'm gonna click on that. All right, now take a look. I want you to notice, let me zoom in on that for you. Notice I've got disk one, which is 60 gigs. This disk is actually running on that other server right now. Uh, and I've got to actually bring it in. So I'm gonna right click this. I'm gonna say, bring it online. Okay, and then it says, okay, it's gotta be initialized. So it says, not initialized. I'm gonna right click it again, initialize the disk. I'm gonna use GPT, which is the newer uh, format for the master boot code on the disk. It's gonna write the signature to the disk, so it's ready. I'm gonna click OK, and as you can see, it's ready. I can now format this disk. I'm gonna do new simple volume, go through this wizard. We're gonna do the full 60 gigs. It's gonna be assigned the E drive Keep in mind, with uh, when it comes to storage area networks, you have drive letters like this, but this is also known as a LUN. It gets assigned a number called a LUN, which is a logical unit number, but it has this drive letter. So I'm going to go ahead and click Next. It asks me what kind of file system I'm going to do. I'm going to do NTFS, all right? Uh, and then I could give the volume a label. I could call it Mailbox DB, MBDB, Mailbox Database, all right? So we'll do perform a quick format, click Finish, and it's now formatting the disk and we now have our E drive showing up as a actual partition. Check this out. If I go to the file explorer, here it is. Here's the E drive. Nothing on it at the moment, but I can create a folder if I want a place where I'm going to be storing uh, my um, databases. I'll just create a folder called um, DB. All right. And then I could point Exchange to store its databases here, okay? Which I, I am going to be showing you. We'll be doing that here coming up.
Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to spend some time looking at how we can uh, go ahead and add some mailboxes, some mailbox databases to our Exchange server, okay? So we're going to start by doing this through the EAC, the Exchange Administrative Center, okay? So I'm going to click Start. If I want to open up the EAC, I can go right here to the Microsoft Exchange Server 2019. I can click this link and it's going to open. Or if you've already got your web browser open, you can go to the name of your server, HTTPS colon slash slash name of your server slash ECP, okay? Which as you can see, I've already done, all right? So uh, what I want to do now is I am going to go and we're going to go to the area where we can create some databases here on our Exchange on-prem server, okay? So uh, I'm going to zoom in on this for you so you can see it a little bit better, okay? And I'm going to click on the servers menu option here on the left, okay? And as you can see, we, you've got your servers list here, but what we want to focus on right now is the database. So we're going to click on the database. And Exchange comes with just one mailbox database, which you'll notice the name of it is uh, mailbox database, and then it, it signs a number at the end of that. Okay, so all Exchange servers, when you install them fresh, you're going to end up with that type of scenario. Okay, uh, the state of the database right now is it is mounted, which means that uh, currently it's active. It's, you're able to use it. It's active. It's only active on this one server right now, though, NYCEX1. That means we are not replicating this database with the use of something called a DAG, a database availability group. Okay, So if I want to create a database, uh, all i got to do is click the little plus sign right here, and it's going to pop a box up on my screen, and I can give that database a name. Okay, So maybe my database is going to be for my sales department, so I'm just going to create a database called sales. Okay. And then I got to specify the server. Of course, uh, at this point, I've only got one server set up, so uh, I'm going to be pointing to the uh, NYC EX1 server. Okay, so I'm going to select NYC EX1, click OK to that, and this is where I get to specify my database path. Now, the default database path is the C colon slash, uh, slash program files Microsoft Exchange v15 mailbox and it's going to try to store it in that area right there, okay? But I have set up a iSCSI virtual disk, and that iSCSI virtual disk is stored over on uh, my E drive, which is actually stored over on a different server. It's actually on the NYC um, DC1 server. So if you watched my previous lesson, you saw me set up iSCSI, and we're, we're going to actually going to utilize that E drive here, okay? So we're going to say e colon slash db slash sales dot edb, okay? And then this path here is where do we want to store the transaction logs, okay? So I'm just going to put in e colon slash db for the transaction logs, okay? And then it's going to ask me if I want to go ahead and mount this database. So I can choose to have that selected, and it is going to go ahead and mount that database. So I'm going to hit save, all right? And it's now going to go through the process of creating that database. And then it's going to mount the database. And then it's also going to ask me if I want to restart the service. OK, so uh, it's done. And you can see that it says, please restart the Microsoft Exchange Information Store service on NYC EX1. OK, uh, so it's, it's telling me that the IS, the Information Store service, needs to be restarted. OK, so we can do that graphically very easily just by opening up Server Manager here, going to Tools, uh, Services. Okay, we're going to scroll down and find that uh, particular service that they're wanting me to restart. Okay, so we'll go down here to Microsoft Exchange, and here it is right here, the Information Store. All right. So all I'm going to do is I'm simply just going to right click that and I'm going to say restart and that's going to restart this service for me. So as you can see it's running through that and this is going to restart the service so that it can associate to that new mailbox database. Okay, Exchange is uh, supposed to kind of do that on its own but it's a, more of a safety thing than anything else restarting the, uh, the information store service. Okay, so we got our information store uh, restarted. I want to now take a look at the database. So what I'm going to do is open up File Explorer here. Uh, we'll go into File Explorer. We're going to browse over to that E drive. I'm just going to verify the database is there and just take a look at it all together here. So 
Here we are in the folder I created earlier called uh, DB. We're going to click on that, and if you look closely, you can see all the different files are there. Okay, so uh, we've discussed these uh, these files in the past. You have the actual database file. You have the different transaction logs that are available uh, for us. So um, I'm just going to simply say, show me the file extension so I can see all the file extensions. So you can see the, the database, you can see the reserve files, the JRS files, you can see the checkpoint file here, and your different transaction logs. Okay, So that gives you just kind of a quick glimpse of the uh, actual database itself and uh, where it's located at. So what I want to do now is I want to take a look at the exchange management uh, shell and we will look at creating databases through the exchange management shell as well. Okay, so I'm going to go over here now and we can click start. We can go to the Microsoft Exchange Server 2019 folder and we can click on the exchange management shell. Keep in mind it does take a few seconds to load up. I went ahead and loaded it up for us, so here it is. All right, so I want to show you how you can create a mailbox database using PowerShell, using the Exchange Management Shell. So to do this, we're going to use a command called new-mailbox-database. All right, so just hit and tab on that. And then specify the name of the database, okay? Uh, and then we can just call the database, you know, whatever we want to, whatever we want to call it. I'm going to call this one marketing. Okay, so that's what we're going to name it. Let me put that in quotation marks. All right, marketing. And then the next thing we got to do is specify where the uh, EDB file is going to be at. So I'm going to say dash EDB file path, and we're going to do E colon slash. Now, if I wanted to, I could store it in that same folder uh, with the sales database, or if I want, I could create a different folder. I'm just going to call it marketing db slash and we'll call it marketing.edb okay very original names here <laughs> uh, and then I'm going to specify the name of the server that this is going to go on which obviously is going to be this uh, NYC EX1 server okay so there's a dash server switch and we're going to do NYC dash EX1 and we're going to go ahead and hit enter Okay, so uh, the database has been created, and you'll notice there it is. It says, please restart the Microsoft Exchange Information Store. So it is asking me to restart. I, I did that earlier for you graphically. Let's do it through um, PowerShell now. So I'm going to say restart-service, and then we're going to do the name of the service is MS Exchange IS. Keep in mind, guys, you could have typed get-service, and it would show you all the services and that way you could have identified this particular name here which I had already done so uh, at that point I was able just to basically just run the command and as you can see it's going through the process now it stopped the service and it's officially starting the services now okay so it only takes a few seconds and then at that point uh, you've got your service ready to roll alright so here we are and the database is there. I'm going to type get dash mailbox database. I'm going to hit enter and what it's going to do now it's going to query Microsoft Exchange and show me the different databases. So as you can see I have the marketing database listed there. However right now if we look at this uh, marketing database in Exchange, let me go back over here into Exchange Admin Center and we'll just simply refresh the uh, the screen here you're going to notice that the database currently is not mounted. The marketing database is not mounted. Now, of course, I could mount it graphically if I wanted to, but uh, what's the fun in that, right? Let's do it. Let's do it through PowerShell. So uh, I'm going to go now and I'm going to type mount dash database. So it's mount dash database, and then the parameter is identity and then we're just going to specify the name of the database which is marketing. At that point it's going to go through the process of mounting that marketing database. Okay so the database is now mounted uh, I can jump back in here to the Exchange Management Center and I can refresh the screen and you'll notice that it is now officially mounted. Okay, The database itself if we edit the database marketing database here you'll see that it is on the eDrive marketing DB marketing EDB is the location 
Okay, so what if I want to move this database to a different place? So what if I want to take it away from this, uh, this E drive and maybe put it on, um, I don't know, the C drive, okay? Why don't we do that? Let's, let's create a, a folder on the C drive uh, and I'll just call that folder um, marketing. And I'm gonna move the marketing database. Now I can't do that graphically, I'm gonna do that with um, PowerShell, okay? So we got to jump back over here into the EMS, all right? And we're going to type move dash database path, okay? Dash identity, and we're going to specify the name of the database, which is marketing, okay? And then we're going to specify the EDB file path here that we are going to move the database to. We are going to move the database to C colon slash marketing slash marketing dot edb okay and then as far as the log goes we got to specify that too so we're going to say dash log path and it's also going to be the c colon slash marketing folder so we're going to hit enter and it's now going to process all of that it's going to go through the process of moving it oh it's going to actually make me confirm it as well so it says are you sure you want to do this i'm going to say yeah do it yes to everything basically all right it says, all right, to perform the move on the operation must be temporarily dismounted. Are you sure you want to do that? Yes. Go ahead and let it temporarily dismount. And uh, now it's officially going to go through that process of moving the database. Okay, so the database has officially been moved, and I should be able to open up File Explorer, uh, go over here to my C drive marketing, and the database should now be safely tucked away inside that folder. And as you can see, the marketing database is now on the C drive. Now my sales database is still over on that database folder on the, the E drive, but uh, the marketing DB folder, as you can see, is now empty on that E drive, okay? All right, guys, so hopefully that gives you a good understanding now of going through the process of creating databases, both graphically uh, through the EAC as well as using the Exchange Management Shell. Now that we've gone through the process of creating some Exchange Mailbox databases, uh, I want to look now at configuring the databases and managing some of the different settings that we have available for those databases. So to do that, we'll start out by looking at this graphically. I'm going to open up the Exchange Administrative Center again. Okay, as always, we're going to be on the server option here, databases, and then here's our, our couple of databases that we've already got available to us. Okay, so I'm going to click on the sales database and I'm going to click this little edit icon, this little pencil icon here. We're going to edit that. All right. And this is going to allow us to go in now. We're going to be able to change some of the different options that are available. All right. So we'll go right here under limits. And let's take a look at these different limits that I've got available. So the first thing you'll see there is you'll see an issue a warning at. Okay. Uh, so that is set for issue the warning at 1.9 gigs. So that means at 1.9 gigs, um, the user will eventually get a message in their inbox that says, hey, you are running out of space. You have got to start freeing up some space or you're not going to be able to send and receive email. Okay, so we're going to set that uh, warning limit. We're going to set that to three gigs, okay, for salespeople. And then the next thing you'll see is the prohibit send at. Now that's set to two gigs. So what's going to happen right now is when they get to two gigs, it's going to prevent them from uh, being able to send. Well, that's not going to work because our warning level is at three gigs. So why don't we set the prohibit send at, uh, we'll say 3.5 gigs, okay? Uh, the next option is prohibit send and receive at, and that's set for uh, 2.3. We're going to set that to four gigs. So when we get to four gigs, you can't send or receive, all right? but they are gonna keep getting these uh, warning messages until they free up some space there in their mailbox, okay? Uh, and then we've got keep deleted items for a certain amount of days. So essentially, uh, we haven't really gotten into the whole deletion of, of items yet in exchange, but we have soft deleted items where items will get deleted and then they can be permanently deleted after a certain amount of time. So uh, this is telling you to keep these deleted items for 14 days. We're gonna change that to 30 days, okay? So now these uh, items will be retained for 30 days. Now keep in mind, we're gonna get into some, some more concepts when it comes to dealing with users' deleted data in some of our further, further discussions because 
obviously uh, objects getting deleted, items getting deleted in people's mailboxes is kind of a touchy subject with people and we want to make sure that um, we have that information backed up somehow, right? Okay, the next thing you've got is keep deleted item, keep deleted mailboxes for a certain amount of days, okay? So this is going to happen where if you deleted somebody's mailbox, let's say you had an employee who left the company and you decided, okay, we don't need this mailbox anymore, we delete the mailbox, uh, Exchange is going to hold on to that, it's going to do a basically a soft delete. For 30 days, you'll be able to recover that mailbox. We're going to set that to 60 days. So Exchange is going to hold on to mailboxes in this database for 60 days. Okay, the other option you'll notice is I can say don't permanently delete items until the mail until the database is backed up. So essentially, the cool thing about that is it's going to keep storing your database, your data in the database until that stuff gets backed up, until you have actually performed an official backup on the database. All right. Now the other thing you'll notice down here towards the bottom is I have a warning message interval right here that'll let me set um, when the warning message is going to go out. And you'll notice the warning message is going to go out every, uh, you know, in the at midnight essentially, 12 a.m. It's going to happen. It's going to send these warning messages out. If you wanted to, you could customize this further and uh, adjust that schedule a little bit if you want. If you wanted to happen uh, during other hours, you can you can alter this uh, these little fields here, and it'll actually send the warning messages out at another time as well. Okay. So, okay. So these are some of our limitations, some of our limits that we've got on. Uh, our, our database right now, okay? We're, we're not getting into uh, offline address books yet or uh, all about the maintenance and journaling and all that stuff just yet, but I wanted to go over these limits with you guys uh, real quick. Now, I also want to show you that I can save all of this and I can also tweak all of this using um, uh, the EMS, using Exchange uh, Management Shell, okay? So what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up EMS and we're going to look at how we can do this using PowerShell. Okay, so I'm going to go into the EMS now, and first thing I want to do is I just want to see my databases. So I'm going to type git dash mailbox database. We're going to hit enter on that, and it's going to display those same three databases that we saw earlier. Okay, so the one I want to target here is the marketing database, and we're going to change some of the parameters of that marketing database right now. Okay. So I'm going to do set-mailbox-database-identity, and it's going to be, of course, marketing. And then we're going to do the dash deleted items retention parameter, and we're going to set that to 20. Uh, and the way that this is going to work is you'll do 20 dot, and then you're going to do the, 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 day, the hours, um, minutes, seconds, all that. So you're going to do this right here, and that's going to be the format that it'll have to be in. So 20 period and then 00 colon 00 colon 00. The next thing I'm going to do is this circular logging enabled parameter. This is kind of a neat parameter. This will enable circular logging with the, with the, the logging of the database. Uh, and you didn't see that graphically. Now if I want to turn this on, I'm going to have to do a dollar sign true. Okay. Now. I don't know how familiar you are with dealing with uh, what's called Boolean in, uh, in PowerShell, but that's a true or false statement. Anytime in PowerShell you are illustrating a true or false, it's always going to be a dollar sign true or dollar sign false. So that's always going to be the way that's going to work. All right. So in this case, I'm turning it on. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do dash prohibit. Let's do prohibit uh, send quota. All right, and we'll set that to 2.2 gigabytes. Let's do that, all right? So I've got my parameters in there that I want. I, I could, of course, specify the parameters. Remember, you can do a, a dash and you can cycle through all the different parameters that are available. And of course, as I've told you before, it's a good idea to open up this uh, the knowledge base on Microsoft's website for this command so you can see all the different parameters and you can also see an example of using the uh, the command you see a couple of examples of using the command okay so as you can see I've now officially uh, set this up now one thing I want to tell you about is anytime you um, you change uh, parameters like this it's going to want you to dismount and remount the graphical tool can do this automatically but the uh, EMS does not so I'm actually going to type dismount dash database dash identity 
and then the name of the database that I'm dismounting. So we're going to dismount the marketing database and it says, okay, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, I am sure I want to do this. And it's going to go through the process now of dismounting the database. And then at that point, we're going to remount the database. So we're going to say mount dash database identity marketing. And it's going to now officially remount that database. And I will be able to uh, go ahead and verify that all of that is done and we'll actually check the different um, parameters that are in that database right now and just make sure that it set the parameters to what we wanted them to. Okay, so now that it's mounted, I'm going to minimize EMS, jump back into the EAC, Exchange Management uh, Center here, and we're gonna go ahead and click on this, uh, this marketing uh, database and we'll go ahead and edit the marketing database and we'll check on the limitations that were set. Okay, so clicking on limits here, as you can see, uh, this is all set up the way I had it. I had set the keep deleted items for 20 days and the other parameter that I had set was the pro prohibit send at. So all that did get changed for me exactly the way I wanted the PowerShell command to do it. So Hopefully that gives you guys now a, a decent understanding of going into the EAC and being able to modify some of the different parameters of the database and then also using the Exchange Management Shell to modify these parameters as well. So um, hopefully that provides you a little bit of foundation there and uh, now that we know how to create databases and do con some configurations, we can eventually start moving towards uh, creating recipients and tying those recipients to our databases and all that. Okay, I'd like to talk now about uh, dealing with issues involving our mailbox database. So we're going to look at troubleshooting mailbox databases. Now there's an absolutely great tool that uh, Microsoft has available to us to assist us in dealing with problems with our mailbox databases. So first off, we have this tool called the ESUEUtil. Okay, the ESUEUtil. Uh, is going to be one of your main tools that will help you deal with, with uh, database related problems. Uh, one of the things that can happen sometimes with databases is um, what's called a dirty shutdown. Um, some of your, your services can get shut down and the database doesn't get properly mounted and in a dirty, dirty shutdown of a database it can cause issues with the database getting fragmented and, uh, and all that. So Microsoft has this, uh, this tool available to us for checking to see if a database is healthy, if it's clean, uh, or if it's, been a, it's, been, it's gone through a dirty shutdown. And of course we can also go through the process of trying to repair any corruptions uh, as well as we can do a defragment of the database. Okay, so as you can see here uh, in this slide, we've got, some, we've got a bunch of different switches that are available to us. What we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna dismount our, our database and we are going to want to um, run some of these commands in order to check to see if our database is has been a, a dirt, gone through a dirty shutdown and if it needs to be defragmented and um, we can fix corruption and all that using this command. Okay, so that gives you a little idea. Why don't we jump over now and I'll and I'll run a couple of these commands and show you how this is going to work. Okay, so on the uh, NYC EX1 server, this is my Exchange server, uh, looking at the um, Exchange Administrative Center. Uh, I'm on I'm looking at my databases and right now my databases say they're mounted everything's looking fine uh, your server your database here is active it's mounted but what if it's not active what if it's mounted it's not active what if uh, you boot your exchange server up and, and you're noticing that it's not able to actually bring this database online you're getting an error message all that one thing you can do is you can look in the event viewer if I start down if I start the uh, right click the start button here I can open up my event viewer and I can go through my logs and look to see what my logs are saying in regards to exchange if uh, exchange is throwing errors involving um, my my database okay so I have application logs I can look at here I can also load up um, the operating system logs and if you expand right here under application and services logs you can actually look at logs that are specific to Microsoft Exchange. Over here we've got the Microsoft Exchange management okay and uh, I've only got so much memory so it's it's lagging on me just a little bit but uh, if you look you can you can check out these logs here for Microsoft Exchange you can look for errors and things like that that are going on of course I actually do have couple errors but they're not related to my database okay 
Um, but my point is, is you can go through this and you can look through uh, your exchange logs. You can look through the application log, the system log. You can look for errors and look for things pertaining to your database, okay? Now, as far as is also analyzing your database and trying to determine what's going on, uh, what I want to do is I want to go into EMS for this, okay? So the Exchange Management Shell, we're going to open that up, all right? And I'm just going to clear the screen so we got a nice, fresh uh, look at it. And we have the SE Util, but what I want to do first is I need to stop the database or dismount the database that I'm going to be looking at. So I'm, I'm actually going to say get dash mailbox database, and that'll list out our databases. And I'm going to run the dismount dash database identity marketing, and we're gonna we're gonna dismount that marketing database. It says, okay, are you sure you want to do it? Uh, yes, I'm sure. And then at that point, we are going to run this command here, which is going to be the ESE util. So I'm going to say ESE util, and I'm going to do slash mh. Okay, and this is going to show me the health of the database. So I'm going to do, um, we'll do c colon slash marketing slash marketing dot edb. Okay, so it's generating a bunch of information for me here to look at. All right, as you can see, ESEUTIL slash MH, this is going to show me the health of the database. And uh, I want to just kind of look through this. It's giving me some information. And this is what I want to see, clean shutdown, not dirty shutdown. Okay, now, of course, I can still, if this was a dirty shutdown, I still could go through and, and run through the you know, defragmenting process and all that if I want um, to try to fix some, some issues. If the database is fragmented or whatever, I can do this. I can type ESEUtil uh, slash D. This is going to be for defragment. And we're going to do C colon slash marketing slash marketing dot EDB. Okay. And as you can see, it's gone through and it's fragmented. It's defragmenting the database. It went really fast because obviously it's not actually fragmented. Okay, so at, at that point, the uh, the only other thing I really need to do is bring my database back up and running. So we'll say mount dash database, and we'll do dash identity marketing, and that's going to bring our database back up. All right, so that gives you a little bit of some information. You definitely should uh, familiarize yourself with these different uh, ESE util switches uh, you saw in my slide, and um, you know try those out a little bit, uh, practice with those a little bit. Uh, it's it's not something commonly we should have to do a whole lot in Exchange, but definitely if your database is something happens, they get something uh, like a dirty shutdown occurs, you can you can clean that up, fix that, defragment. And then don't forget, keep an eye on the event viewer for any errors or anything like that you get so that you know um, that something's wrong. Of course, uh, if you go into your, your, uh, your Exchange Administrative Center and you notice that your uh, database is mounted but it's not active, something's wrong. You try to bring it online, it's not working. You tried rebooting maybe your server, it's not working. At that point, it was probably a dirty shutdown and you need to be looking into this ESE util. All right. So hopefully that gives you guys a good understanding of that just a little bit of the troubleshooting concepts uh, in dealing with the exchange and definitely you want to be a little bit familiar with that ESE util. If you're going to take the exam you need to know what that ESE util does, the, the defragmentation and the dirty shutdown and, uh, and all that. We're now ready to go over the concepts of understanding exchange recipients. So what exactly are the different recipients we have in exchange? So recipients are going to be objects that can represent something that mail flow can occur against. So you can have uh, mail flowing out to certain recipients, mail flowing into certain recipients. Uh, ultimately, Exchange has got to have an object that's going to represent something that's going to be receiving email, and uh, we've got to essentially understand the different types. All right. So there are different types of recipients in Exchange. Uh, as you can see here on the screen, there's actually quite a few. All right, now the, the most common type of recipient in Exchange is the one you see right there first. It is a user mailbox, okay? So a user mailbox is a mailbox that is created that is going to be stored in a mailbox database, and it is going to be able to uh, receive email 
from uh, within your organization or even the outside world if you allow all of that to occur, okay? Uh, so this is going to be, um, you're going to have a mail-enabled user. This is going to be a, a user in, um, in, if you're talking purely just on-premise Active Directory, then your on-prem Active Directory ADDS. Of course, with Exchange Online, the, uh, the user could, could exist right out there in the cloud only. You can have what is called a cloud only account, and you can have a user mailbox stored in only Exchange Online, okay? So a uh, user mailbox could be with Exchange on-prem. You could have a user mailbox with Exchange Online. Uh, and either way, you're going to have a, a user identity that's going to be associated with it, okay? Uh, now you've also got what is called a mail contact. A mail contact is going to be uh, an object that represents the contact information for somebody usually outside your organization, okay? A good example, I, I'm a consultant, so I do consulting work with different companies, and uh, I have an email address that I use, and of course, uh, a lot of different companies out there, they'll put me as a mail contact, so they'll have my name listed, and then they'll have the email address uh, associated with that. I don't actually have a mailbox in their uh, environment, and most of the time I don't even have a user in their environment, okay? Uh, but they can open up their exchange environment, they can find my name, and then they can email me, okay, using that mail contact. We've also got uh, a mail user. Now, this is where things can get a little fuzzy for people. They hear about mail user, and then they get confused on, well, what is the difference between a mail user and a user mailbox, or what we call a uh, mail enabled user. So a mail user is an account that actually has a uh, um, an a, like an account in Active Directory or or in the cloud, and the account itself links to a mailbox that's not within the organization. Okay. So for example, uh, maybe our co our company has a consultant that comes into our company, and maybe his name is John Smith. Okay. Uh, and he works for, uh, let's say, a company called Trey Research. And Exam Lab uh, uh, Practice is going to maybe hire him on occasions to come in and work with our organization. So what we do is we create him a account here in our Active Directory environment, and we create a, an email address for him, John Smith at examlabpractice.com. But he really he has an email address called John Smith at treyresearch.com. So what happens is if anybody emails John Smith at examlabpractice.com, it's going to go to that uh, that person. That um, it's actually going to go to John Smith at treyresearch.com. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've had this happen before, uh, where I've done consulting work with companies, uh, and they wanted me to have a company official company email. Okay so that if I was interacting with any of their customers, I could give out that official email. But uh, what would happen is somebody emails that account, it actually redirects it to my other email, my real email. Okay, so I don't actually, that mail user does not really have a mailbox, okay? It's just going to redirect. This is different from a mail contact in that the mail contact, when somebody pulls up the mail contact uh, in their global address list in Exchange, maybe through Outlook, uh, they're going to see that person's other email address. So if John Smith was just a mail contact and somebody was emailing John Smith, they would clearly see that his email address is John Smith at treyresearch.com. Okay, but um, if he's a mail user, it's going to be John Smith at examlabpractice.com, the the company's organization name. So that's going to be your big difference there. Okay, uh, you've also got a resource mailbox. A uh, resource mailbox is a is a um, situation where a resource at your company actually gets a uh, a mailbox. Now this can be uh, one example that I could actually have a mailbox associated with a conference room, for example. So it's like a room based mailbox. Uh, let's say you work for a company and you got three. Uh, conference rooms, three meeting rooms, and people are obviously booking meetings and things like that, but they've got to have a way to book the meeting for the conference room. Well, you can use Exchange to do that. With a resource mailbox, I can have uh, a calendar associated with it, uh, availability associated with it, so somebody can book through the calendar uh, with Exchange, the global address list, they can book that meeting room for, uh, let's say, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. today. And that way we don't have people double booking the, the meeting rooms. Uh, if you had three meeting rooms, then, and that somebody discovers the first meeting room is already booked, they could use one of the other ones if it's available. Now, another uh, option to that 
is with the resource mailbox, you actually can um, have pieces of equipment that have mailboxes as well. Like for example, um, and this is kind of strange, but let's say you had three meeting rooms, but only one projector, okay? Um, and you kind of had to share that projector between the meeting rooms. You could book the meeting room and then book the projector. Uh, if there, if that one projector was already booked, well, you wouldn't be able to use the projector, okay? Um, or, you know, maybe you've got more than one projector, but sometimes salespeople take the projectors out of the office to do things with them. And that would be a reason why maybe, oh, no, we have five projectors, three meeting rooms, but uh, uh, let's say three salespeople took three of the projectors, and now there's only two projectors, and they're already being booked by two of the rooms. So a third room would not have a projector. So that's sort of the idea there. That's that's the concept of a resource mailbox. You have that it's an object that represents some physical uh, thing, whether it's a room or whether it's a piece of equipment, and that way people can book through the calendar. Uh, you have a shared mailbox. This is going to be a mailbox that is shared by multiple people. Okay, so essentially I could have, uh, a, a, let's say a, we have different, let's say we have three different receptionists in our office. Uh, we could have an email address called reception at examlabpractice.com and there, and that way, um, all three of those people could respond to that email account. We have mail enabled security and distribution groups. Okay, so uh, this is a, a group that can get an email address. Okay, now if it is a mail enabled security group, then you can put people in the group and the group gets an email address. For example, I have I might have the sales department and I might have a group called sales that's mail enabled security. And so if I put a bunch of people in that mail-enabled security group, the uh, email address would be sales at examlabpractice.com, okay, and then the email would go to everybody in that, that's in that group. So each user that's part of that mail-enabled security group would get the email. The other thing that you can do with the mail-enabled security group is you can actually assign it permissions to things. I can give out uh, access to resources and things like that with permissions. Now that is where distribution groups are different. Mail-enabled distribution groups are groups that can purely only be used for email. You cannot assign any permissions to a mail-enabled distribution group. So if I created a mail-enabled distribution group called sales, then anybody I put in that group would, would get the email if you emailed sales at examlabpractice.com, but you could not assign any permissions to that. Okay, now there's another cool feature that we're going to look at called dynamic distribution groups. This is really neat. This is a, a query based uh, group. So what I can actually do is I can create rules on that group that uh, make you part of that group depending upon certain attributes of your account. For example, I could create a group called marketing and uh, I could associate that to the department attribute of your user account. Okay. And if the department attribute of your user account says that you are part of marketing, then the email would go to you. Okay, so that's really neat. Um, and, and really, the great thing about that is if anybody ever switches departments or something like that and you change their department attribute, then you would no longer be part of that group. So it's a more dynamic uh, process. And, and guys, keep in mind, we're going we're gonna to be taking a look at all this. I'm just kind of overviewing this for you right now, but we're going to do some hands-on and, and I'll demonstrate all this here coming up. Uh, you've also got what is called a linked mailbox, okay? So a linked mailbox is a mailbox in which we are linking uh, a user that may exist in a different uh, Active Directory forest. So, for example, I might have a user in the examlabpractice.com forest, okay? And then maybe I have another forest called, uh, let's call it Acme Corporation or acmecorp.com, and we have a trust relationship with that uh, other forest, other domain, other forest. I could have a user, maybe I got a user named, um, let's say Jane Doe, that works in that other office or that other company, but we want Jane Doe to have one of our email addresses. So I can do a linked mailbox to that other domain, and it could be Jane Doe at examlabpractice.com, even though Jane Doe's account exists somewhere else. And then the last one you'll see here is the remote mailbox. The concept of remote mailbox is where you have a, a user in Active Directory, but you don't have, you're not using that user with an on-premise exchange. 
your user's email mailbox is going to exist out in Exchange Online. So the idea here is, is you've got the user account on premise, but the user's email mailbox is actually stored out in the cloud. All right, so that is called a remote mailbox. Okay, so how are we going to do all this? And again, I am going to demonstrate all this, but just want to clarify a couple things here. Uh, I'm going to do all this either graphically using the Exchange Administrative Center. You can do quite a bit with recipients with the graphical tool. Uh, and then, of course, I also can utilize uh, EMS, which is the Exchange Management Shell, in which you'll see some of the commands there that I can use to work with mailboxes. I can search different mailboxes by typing get mailbox, uh, create a new mailbox by typing new mailbox, modify the parameters of a mailbox by using the set mailbox, uh, I can enable a mailbox if there's been one that's been disabled using the enable mailbox commandlet. And then lastly, if I would like to delete a mailbox, I can delete the mailbox by typing remove mailbox. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of the different types of recipients that we're dealing with, uh, what the, their jobs are, what, what you're working with there, and then also gives you an idea we're going to be using the graphical tool and then of course the command line tool to uh, to do all of this. Okay, so. Uh, here coming up, that's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to do some hands-on with it. We're going to look at the graphical ways to do it, and we're going to look at the PowerShell ways to do it. Now that we've gone over the different recipient types, why don't we go in and we're going to create some? So we're going to we're going to walk through the steps here, uh, both graphically as well as uh, in the Exchange Management shell, on how we can actually create and manage our recipients. Okay, so we're going to start out in the Exchange Administrative Center. All right. Uh, so I'm just going to pull up my web browser here, and as you can see, I've, I've got the Exchange Management Center. So you just go to nyc-ex1-ecp, so the name of your Exchange server slash ecp, okay? And that'll bring you in there. Uh, and then at that point, we're going to look at here at this recipients object. We're going to click on that, and we've got mailboxes, groups, resources, contacts, shared, and migration, okay? So we're going to click this little plus sign here, and I'm going to go ahead and click on User Mailbox. All right, so that's going to bring up this little box up on my screen here, kind of zoom in for you there. All right, and at that point, I'm going to give the uh, object an alias. So the alias is going to be the name before the at symbol in a email address or what's called a UPN, a user principal name, okay? So uh, let's say that I'm going to be creating this new user, and this new user, his name is going to be Chad Dawson. All right, Chad Dawson is going to be our alias name for this user. Okay. Now this user is not an existing user in our Active Directory environment here with our on-prem exchange. So I'm not going to choose existing user. I'm going to choose a new user. All right. So we're going to go ahead and put in first name and then last name alright and so what's cool about this is it's it's gonna actually create me an Active Directory domain user right now so I don't actually have to go into Active Directory users and computers like I normally would or the Active Directory Administrative Center in order to do this this can actually happen right here from your EAC okay uh, I can also specify an organizational unit that maybe I would like this Chad user to be stored in it'll let me select which uh, organizational unit, which is a container in Active Directory, where that's going to be stored. So maybe this user is going to be located in New York and he's going to be in the NY Users OU. Okay, so we're going to click OK to that. That's where he's going to put him. All right, and at that point, it's asking me user logon name. Uh, I'm going to go with Chad Dawson as his user logon name, and he is going to be part of examlabpractice.com. All right. Uh, and so that's going to be his uh, e his email address and all that. So now I'm going to just give him a password. So let's let's do that real quick. Give him a password. All right. And uh, of course, you know the password requirements for Exchange is going to be the same as with Active Directory because it is, of course, creating this in your Active Directory environment. If you want the user to change the password at next logon, you can also select that. Okay. And then there's some more options that we can configure here. If I wanted to configure uh, which mailbox database he's going to be a part of, I can just click that. I can say Browse. And remember, we created some, some mailbox databases a little early. Maybe Chad is going to be a sales guy. So we're going to go ahead and associate him to the sales mailbox database. 
okay uh, and then from there I can do an archive uh, mailbox I can enable archive we'll get to that a little bit later and I have an address book policy here too which I'm gonna go over that with you also a little bit later so uh, those are my uh, options for creating this mail enabled user so I'm just gonna go ahead now and hit save all right, so now that's going to officially save that Chad Dawson user, and he's now been officially created uh, using the EAC. Okay, so what I want to look at now with you is how we can do this using the EMS, okay, the uh, Exchange Management Shell. All right, so we're going to open up the, uh, the EMS. As always, we can get into EMS just by going down here to start, uh, clicking on Exchange Server 2019, in this case, or Exchange Server 2016 or whatever you've got and then you'll see the Exchange Management Shell. I went ahead and opened it up because it does take a few seconds to load everything up into memory and that'll save us a little bit of time. Okay now the first thing you should do when you're wanting to create a a user um, a, a user enabled mailbox here um, mailbox enabled user I should say you are going to you need to actually have a password. Now you can create the password while the mailbox is create, being created, but uh, I want to show you how you can store an encrypted password into a variable. Okay, so I'm actually going to type a command he here. I'm going to do dollar sign pw. Okay, that's going to be dollar sign password. We're declaring a variable here in PowerShell. <clears throat> the variable is going to store this password for us in an encrypted format. So the first thing we got to do though is we got to prompt for that password. Okay. So I'm going to use this command called read-host, okay, and then I'm just going to put in enter password. Really, you could put anything you want there, okay, and then I'm going to do dash as secure string, okay. So that little parameter there is going to make it where whatever I enter in after that read host uh, box, it's going to essentially uh, encrypt that password, okay. So I'm going to hit enter and look what it does. It says, okay, enter in the password. So I'm going to put in this password, and it is stored that now into a variable. Now, if you call upon that variable and try to look at that password, you're going to notice that it won't show it to you. It's actually in an encrypted string right now. Okay, you can use this a lot uh, in in uh, Active Directory for or for PowerShell in dealing with Active Directory or dealing with Exchange or even other either other services. Another option you can go with is you can do like I could say dollar sign pass equals get dash credential and that's another way of doing it and it'll actually pop it up in a little box on your screen and you can specify a username and password if you do that okay now in my case though I just need the password so I just hit cancel and obviously it throws an error if you hit cancel but now what I'm gonna do is actually create the the account alright the mailbox so I'm gonna say new dash mailbox alright dash user principal name and then whatever I want this user's name to be okay so let's say I want this user to be a user named uh, Chris Ashton alright so we'll do Chris Chris Ashton alright and that's gonna be his his uh, alias part of his name then we'll say at exam lab practice dot com alright and then the next thing we're going to do is it won't, I do need to specify the alias officially, which is going to be Chris Chris Ashton, all right. And uh, I'm going to specify the database that I want Chris Ashton to be a part of. He is going to be part of the marketing database. He is maybe maybe he is a marketing user, okay. Uh, so we're going to put him in that marketing database, all right. And then at that point, I'm going to specify his full name kind of a, gets a little redundant here but Chris Ashton all right uh, and of course I'll I'll capitalize that Chris Ashton there we go okay uh, now we're gonna specify the organizational unit um, I don't believe I've got a marketing OU so we'll just say users for this it's just gonna put him in the users container in Active Directory okay and then for password, here's where we're going to use our variable. So I'm going to say dollar sign PW, okay? And that's going to create me, uh, it's going to basically create his password based on what I typed up here, right? Okay, so uh, now we're going to do dash first name, uh, 
Chris dash last name Ashton. Again, it does get a little redundant, but uh, now we'll do dash display name, and the display name will be Chris Ashton. So this is what you're going to see when you see it on the screen. And then I can do the reset uh, password on next logon. If I want to enable that, I can say dollar sign true. Remember, anytime you're specifying a true or a false, you're going to do that dollar sign true. Okay. Uh, so just reviewing new dash mailbox dash user principal name Chris Ashton at examlabpractice.com dash alias Chris Ashton dash database marketing dash name Chris Ashton or dash organizational unit users dash password uh, and then dash first name Chris last name Ashton display name Chris Ashton reset password okay so it appears we got it right now remember guys one of the real strengths of PowerShell here is that we could do this on a very large scale uh, in fact if I had a, a CSV file, a comma separated value file, let's say that uh, our HR department has just hired like 20 new employees and they gave me a spreadsheet with everybody's name. You could actually import from an, a CSV file, a spreadsheet, comma separated value file, and you could create a bunch of users on a large scale doing this. So it seems like a lot of work. Yeah, if you're just creating one user, it is kind of a bit of work, you know, to do this. but two things here. I could do this on a large scale pulling in from something like a spreadsheet or I could write a script that uh, that would prompt somebody for just this information and then it would create the account uh, on behalf of that person. So there's a lot of reasons why this can be very valuable mostly for the reasons of automation. That's where you're really going to benefit from dealing with um, uh, PowerShell here. So we're gonna hit enter and we're just gonna verify that it's created the account and as you can see it it officially has created the user and we should be able to jump back in here and refresh our screen and see that that user now exists and as you can see he does okay so that gives you an idea real quick on how do you can actually uh, very easily add a user through the EAC as well as how we can add a user through uh, our EMS I want to talk now about uh, creating a user within Active Directory and then linking their mailbox. And then I also want to look at uh, creating a shared mailbox, okay? So um, we're going to start here. We're on our domain controller, all right? We're going to open up the uh, Active Directory Users and Computers tool. So here in Server Manager, you click Tools and go to Active Directory Users and Computers. Okay, that's going to pop this up. Let me zoom in here for you. Now. Again, in Active Directory user computers, we have organizational units. These are containers. I have an Atlanta, Chicago, and a New York, and we're sort of pretending like we're in the New York office of exam lab practice. And uh, we've got our users, and uh, if you watched the last uh, example, I created a user called Chad Daw uh, Dawson, and then I also created uh, another user that uh, we actually moved into the users container here and um, what I want to do now with you is I want to create a user in Active Directory and we are going to uh, link a mailbox to that user okay create a mailbox and have it linked to that user so I'm just gonna right click here on this uh, NY users new we're gonna say user and this user is going to be called Jan Williams okay and user logon name is just going to be Jan Williams. All right. So this is just doing it through Active Directory. All right. Uh, give the password to the user. Uh, I think I typoed it there. There we go. Okay. And then specify if the user is going to change password to next logon or if the password is going to expire or whatever. You can do all these options here. And we'll click Next, Finish and we've got our user officially created in Active Directory, okay? Maybe uh, we're gonna make Jan, Jan is gonna be a salesperson, okay? So we can put Jan in this sales group if we want. Um, and I believe Chad is also gonna be a salesperson as well, so we might as well just add him into this group also. All right, and we'll click okay. All right, so at that point, uh, I'm going to jump over to my Exchange server now, and we will take a look at what we got to do on the Exchange server side. Okay, so jumping over to Exchange, again, this is going to be NYCEX1. 
and we're already logged on to our EAC. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to go to mailboxes here, and we're going to click. So notice that, that Jan does not have an account, right? So we're going to drop this down. We're going to say user mailbox, all right? And we're going to choose this time, alias is going to be Jan Williams, okay? And then we're going to browse to an existing user. All right, and then as you can see, there's Jan Williams from Active Directory. So we're going to choose Jan Williams. We're going to click Save, and we have now officially created the uh, mailbox for Jan Williams, and we have uh, linked it to that user account. All right, so now that we've done that, I want to create a shared mailbox that both Chris and Jan can, uh, can basically answer emails involving... Uh, this mailbox. This mailbox is going to be called sales contact. All right, so there's going to be an email address sales contact at examlabpractice.com and we want both Chris and Jan to be able to respond uh, and have access to that email account, that mailbox, and be able to respond with that account. Okay, so I'm going to click on shared up here. Currently, I don't I do not have any shared mailboxes. I'm going to click the little plus sign here. All right, and at that point, it's going to ask me what I want, what I, what I want to call it. I'm going to call it sales contact, and the alias will be sales contact. All right, like that. And uh, at that point, we would specify if it's going to go into a particular OU. Okay, so we click browse, and we'll just put it in the uh, New York users OU. All right, and then from here, we're going to give the some permissions. It says. The following users have permissions to view and send mail from this shared mailbox. So we're going to click that plus sign, and we're going to assign both Chad Dawson and Jan Williams, our two salespeople. We're going to assign those. All right. So we've now assigned those. Notice we can also do more options. If we want to choose the mailbox database here, we can choose the mailbox database. We'll do sales. Click OK. And at that point, uh, we could do archive and address book policy, but I'll explain that a little bit later. Okay, so I'm going to hit save. All right, and we've now officially got our account. All right, sales contact at examlabpractice.com. All right, now keep in mind, we could we could also do this through the EMS as well. I've demonstrated creating a, a mailbox through EMS already, so you've seen that. And it's really just uh, sort of the same idea. Now, what I want to show you is... There's a couple other options. So uh, first off, if I if I look at the properties of this mailbox, let's zoom in on that, and let's talk about some of these other options that we've got. If we look at mailbox uh, delegation, you're going to notice a couple of options here. One says full access. The full access permission says it allows the delegate to log on to the shared mailbox and behave as the owner of the mailbox. And you'll notice that um, I've got uh, different users here that can do that. I've got uh, Chad and, and Jan are both users that can do that. And also, of course, the exchange services themselves can do it because they there is uh, things where you can schedule things to happen through exchange. And so the exchange system needs access as well. Now, the other thing I want you to understand is um, just because you can log on to the mailbox and see the email and all of that does not mean that um, you can send on behalf of uh, the mailbox. So if you look here, there's a send as. It says the send as permission allows the delegate to send email from this shared mailbox. From the recipient's perspective, the email is sent by this shared mailbox. So you got to make sure. Now, when we added these two a second ago, that's what gave them this permission. But uh, if you want somebody to be able to send as this mailbox, they've got to be added here, not just have full access. Okay, the full access, as you can see, is going to let you log on to the mailbox and and behave as the owner. You can you basically can modify things in the mailbox, but if you want to send as, you're going to have to have uh, that concept right there, that that feature enabled for you. Okay. Uh, over here, we've got mail usage, which uh, the users never, nobody's ever logged on to the mailbox as of yet, so there's nothing there. It just kind of warns you that nobody's ever logged on. Uh, you have contact info. You could fill this, all this information out, which of course is going to be valuable if uh, for, for what's called the GAL, the global address list, which is how people find their contacts in Exchange. 
And then right here you have organization, if you wanted to add a title department company. Here's the email address as well. Keep in mind if we had another uh, domain name, uh, like ABC Corp or Acme Corporation or some other company, uh, Trey Research, whatever, we could add that here as well and we could have another email address that this can be identified as. But I'm going to get more into that a little bit later. We're going to talk about email address policies and, and all of that stuff coming up. So uh, we got mailbox features. And of course, this is where you start getting into what's called the sharing policy, role assignment policy. We haven't gotten into all the policy stuff yet, but this is where that can be assigned. And eventually, we'll we'll discuss all that. You have member of. This is where you specify uh, groups that this is a member of. I actually don't have any groups in Exchange just yet, so uh, we'll be we'll be adding some group here groups here coming up. And then if, once you do have groups, you could assign this mailbox to the groups if you wanted to. And then I've got mail tips. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about mail tips as well. This is mail tips uh, can pop up on a user's um, Outlook and let them know, hey, we uh, you know this mailbox is used for this, that, or the other. You can you can give different tips, and this is really cool too. When you start getting into the security and compliance side of all of this, where you're you're dealing with users who are attempting to access and share sensitive data, maybe through an attachment, things like that, you can have mail tips pop up and warn them that, hey, you're about to share an attachment with somebody who's outside our organization and it could contain sensitive information. And you can really get some powerful tools here where uh, Exchange will actually analyze what's inside the attachment and see if there's sensitive information, especially when you start getting into the Exchange Online stuff, which of course we're, we're going to be getting into all that too. We're, we're, gonna, we're looking at Exchange On-Prem right now mostly, but we are going to be moving over to the Exchange Online. And of course, if you're taking the exam, they definitely expect you to kind of know both and understand both sides of it. So, um, But don't worry, I'm going to get into all that as well. So these are your different options that you have with this mailbox. At that point, I can hit save. If I've changed anything, it's going to save those settings. And again, uh, you also could use the set mailbox uh, commandlet in the Exchange Management Shell, and you could modify all that stuff through that as well. So that's just another way of going about doing it. But hopefully that gives you a good understanding now of um, creating an account in Active Directory, linking it, uh, creating a mailbox and linking it, and then... Hopefully, uh, it also helps you understand the concepts of a shared mailbox. Okay, so now what I want to look at is the concept of resource mailboxes. We're gonna we're gonna take a look at how to create those, and we'll uh, we'll look at doing it both graphically as well as using PowerShell. Okay, so we're gonna come down here now and open up the Exchange Administrative Center. Okay, NYC-EX1/ECP. All right, and from there, I'm going to click on the recipients object over here, and we're going to go to resources. So here we are on this resources, uh, and we're going to go and click, we're going to create a room mailbox first. So we're going to click that, and it's going to pop a little box up on the screen, and we're going to give the room a name. So I'm just going to simply call it room one. All right, maybe this is going to be a conference room. All right. And we'll just call it room one. And you could call it meeting room one. I mean, you could name it whatever you want. I'm just going to keep it simple. Okay, the alias name is room one. Okay. And then we could specify organizational unit. Uh, we'll just say, hey, it's going to be in New York. And I'm just going to throw it right there in the New York OU. Location is New York. All right. There's not a phone number. Capacity, we'll say, is 30 people. All right. So maximum number of people that can fit in the room comfortably. At that point, I can click more options, and I can specify if there is a mailbox database this is going to be associated with. So I'm going to hit browse, and then we'll go with um, we'll just go with the the default mailbox that we had right when we installed Exchange. All right. So this mailbox database here. All right. Now, if, of course, if it was like a sales conference room, maybe you'd want to tie it to the sales, you know, um, database. Okay. I don't have an address book policy right now for it, and I'm now going to click save. Okay. So our uh, room mailbox has now officially been created. All right. So of course, as always, you could edit that if you wanted to. Just click the little pencil icon, and uh, just like the other mailboxes we've seen, we have a few features that we can we can manipulate. All right, 
So there's the capacity example. We've got the more options if we want to, to update some of that information there. You can even add uh, what are called custom attributes. This is kind of a thing where I can add like keywords and things like that that can be searched upon in order to find this room. So when you start getting into scheduling a meeting or something and you're searching for a keyword to describe the room that you're you're dealing with, you could do that. A lot of a lot of meeting rooms even have like names that companies will assign to them. So I've got booking delegates here. It says booking request, accept or decline booking request automatically, or I can select who can accept or decline a booking request. So we could have somebody who is dealing with the, the booking side of things. You got booking options here. Specify when this room can be scheduled. Allow repeating meetings if you want. Allow scheduling only during working hours. So if I wanted to set working hours, I can do that. Allow uh, or always decline if the end of end date is beyond the limit. So if there is an end date and it's gone beyond that, you can you can deny the request to book it. Maximum booking lead time, they say, is 180 days. So they'll let you book uh, 180 days in advance. And then maximum duration, they say, is 24 hours. You could set that, obviously, to whatever you want, okay? It says if you if you want this meeting organizer to receive a reply, enter the text below. So you could specify that in there if you want. And when somebody you know is booking a meeting, it's gonna it's gonna send a message to the uh, organizer of it. Then you got contact information. You could fill all, all that in. You've got the email address. It's gonna be associated with the room. Okay, so room one at examlabpractice.com. You got the mail tips. We talked about these before and then mailbox delegates uh, delegation um, send as and send on behalf okay so I'm just gonna go ahead now and hit save alright and um, at that point I've got my uh, room configured the way I want it alright and now what I want to do is I want to create a equipment mailbox so we'll say equipment and I'm gonna just call this uh, We'll say it's a projector, so we'll say projector one, okay? And of course the alias is gonna be projector one. Same thing, we'll just throw it in the New York OU, okay? All right, so New York, and if I wanna do more options, I can, I can browse, and of course do the same thing, associate it with whichever mailbox database I want, okay? And then I'm gonna hit save and you've got yourself an equipment mailbox now. I can edit the equipment mailbox. Same thing. Uh, you're gonna have a few features here that you can manipulate on the equipment mailbox if you need to. So, same kind of thing. Uh, booking delegates, booking options, contact info, the email address, mail tip, and then the mailbox delegation, okay? Um, by the way, I am going to explain the send as and send on behalf. Uh, I've explained a little bit of that already, but we're going to we're going to go over it a little bit more thoroughly here coming up because this is definitely uh, something testable you're going to want to be aware of, and of course it's valuable for the real world as well. So I'm going to save this. All right, and we've now officially done this uh, using the graphical tool. What I want to show you now is how we can do this using the EMS. So we're going to open up uh, the Exchange Management shell now. As always, you can get there, hit start, and then it's going to be located underneath the Exchange 2019 folder. I've already loaded it up. Okay, so here we are in EMS. All right, and we're now going to type new dash mailbox, okay, dash name, and I'm going to call this room two. All right, room two, and the display name is going to be room two. All right. Uh, and then all we have to really do, this is a kind of a short command, is just flag it as a room uh, attribute. This par room parameter is going to flag this mailbox as a as a room. You could actually go further, and um, you know, as you can see, I can hit um, dash and I can tab through. There's a lot of different uh, attributes you can go with, but that's kind of the mi the bare minimum requirements. So. If I wanted to specify a specific OU and all that, I could. I'm going to hit enter, and it's now officially created the room two. I should be able to pop back over to Exchange and refresh and see that has now been set up. And as you can see, it has. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to do a, a equipment mailbox as well. So we're going to say new dash mailbox dash name 
and this will be projector two. Display name, projector two, and this is gonna be a dash equipment. So see the difference? All right, we're gonna hit enter, and we've now officially created the equipment mailbox. All right, so we should be able to refresh and see that the equipment mailbox is showing up, all right? So we got room one, room two, projector one, projector two. I didn't notice I, I didn't add a space there, but that's okay. Uh, I could alter that if I wanted to. And don't forget, you could use set-mailbox to uh, edit the parameters if you wanted to, okay? All right, so hopefully that gives you guys a, a good understanding now of creating uh, resource mailboxes, both a room as well as an equipment mailbox. I want to talk to you now about doing batch operations in Exchange. Now, we've learned how to go through the process of creating a, a user through the EAC graphically. We've looked at uh, the Exchange Management Shell and how to build users that way. Uh, but one of the things I did mention is that you can do batch operations in Exchange using the Exchange Management Shell. So in this case, we're going to pretend like uh, our, our HR department Human Resources has given us a spreadsheet and uh, the spreadsheet has some new employees that have just been hired. Maybe these new employees are going to be in the marketing department of our company. Okay, So what we want to do now is we want to uh, go through the process of managing and creating these users in bulk. Okay, Now this really isn't a lot of users. You could do this pretty quickly through the EAC, but what if there was like 50 users here? Okay. Uh, that you needed to, to go through the process of creating, right? So um, here's how you do this. So first off, in your spreadsheet, the very first line here is going to indicate fields uh, which are going to tie to parameters that we're going to specify when we create the uh, accounts using this PowerShell command that we're going to that I'm going to show you. Okay. So I've got three things here, but you could do a lot more than that. You could you could specify uh, contact information in the rest of these fields. I'm just kind of doing, you know, three of the minimum things here for, to create these accounts. All right. Again, imagine if there's 50 of these users uh, instead of just a few. But either way, 50 or a few, you can you can get this done very quickly if you had a spreadsheet like this. So uh, we've got the first field is called alias. The second field is the name, and then the third is going to be the UPN, which is going to be the uh, the actual email address that they're going to be assigned. Okay, so we're going to go through now the, the process of doing this. What you would do is you would go to the file menu and you would save the file as a CSV file. Okay, so I've saved the file as a CSV file on my C drive. And if we open up File Explorer, okay, and then we'll see the CSV file is new users. Okay, and I'm going to edit that with Notepad so you can see what it looks like from a notepad standpoint. So really guys, what a CSV file is, it's just text, right? It's just text information. Uh, and as you can see, this is the format which matches what we had in the spreadsheet, okay? So we've got that, we saved it as a as new users.csv. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up uh, the EMS. So as always, we hit start, Click on the Exchange Server 2019 folder and open up EMS, which I've got EMS already open. Okay, so now I'm going to type a command and I'm going to explain this PowerShell command to you as we go on exactly what we're doing here. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm going to do is there's a command called import CSV. Okay, so we're going to run that. That's import comma separated value. Okay, then we got to specify where the file is that we're importing. Okay. And of course, the file is located on our C drive. So we're going to do C colon slash new users dot CSV. Okay, now what you're going to do is you're going to pipe this over to uh, another command, an import command. Okay, now what exactly is piping going to do for us? Piping is going to take the output from this command and associate it to the input of another command. So we're going to use the pipe symbol that's holding down the shift key, hitting that backslash, and then we're going to type for each. Okay, now maybe you've done some programming in, in your time, or maybe you haven't. PowerShell is a programming language. You can program from within PowerShell, and uh, in programming we have a thing called loops. Loops allow you to do what's known as enumeration. Enumeration means I would like to perform 
an action of some kind against a bunch of objects, okay? Uh, and so what I'm going to basically say is I'm going to say for each, and it's going to perform it against every line inside that CSV file. So every every single line that you see here, it's going to perform a task against that line, okay? So we're going to say for each, and then you're going to do what's called an opening curly brace. Uh, the opening curly brace is signaling the uh, PowerShell that, hey, what comes after the curly brace is the action I want to perform against each object, okay? So uh, I'm going to do new dash mailbox, all right, and then dash alias, okay? And then we're going to do this uh, um, variable called dollar sign underscore dot and then the word alias, which is going to match, if you remember, it's going to match this right here, this alias word in our in our uh, CSV file. Now, what exactly is that dollar sign underscore doing? Now, if you're not real real familiar with PowerShell, that dollar sign underscore is a is a variable that represents the current object that this action is being performed against. So, if this is the first object in the pipeline here, if it's this Alex Johnson user then that's what's going to get plugged into that dollar sign underscore. So again, that dollar sign underscore is always illustrating that you're performing an action against that object that's currently in the pipeline, okay? All right, so we're going to do that, and we're going to do dash name, okay? And the dash name is going to be dollar sign underscore dot name, okay? So again, that is going to be performed right against this second part. Okay, so that's going to be this name here, which matches that right there, right? Okay, so uh, we're now going to hit space again, and we're going to do dash user principal name, space, dollar sign underscore dot, and then the UPN, right? Which is what's inside that uh, file. So that is going to match that last part, the UPN, right here which of course for this first object in the pipeline, that would be Alex Johnson at examlabpractice.com. Okay, so that's how that's gonna work. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna specify the database that this is gonna be part of, dash database, and we're gonna say that these were all new marketing employees. So we're gonna add them to the marketing database that we created, all right? And then we're going to do dash organizational unit. We'll just throw them in the users container of Active Directory. Okay. And then the last thing we need to do is specify what the password is. Now, I've shown you before how you can specify a password in a variable. Uh, you can do dollar sign PW equals, and then you can do the read host and get the password. Okay. Which we've done that before. Uh, so we're going to do do, uh, dash password and then the dollar sign PW and then at that point we have got our uh, our password. And again, guys, if you uh, I'll just kind of you know uh, refresh your memory on that. If I wanted to, um, I'll just I'll just copy this real quick. If I needed to specify that password, I could say dollar sign PW equals and I can do read dash host, okay, enter password, okay, and then dash as secure string. So I showed you how to do that earlier. I was just kind of demonstrating that for you again. Okay, now I'm going to put that command back in now that you've seen me uh, re-demonstrate that. And I think we've got everything we need. So it's import dash CSV, uh, new user CSV, for each new mailbox alias name, user principal name, and database. I believe we got all that correct, so we're going to hit enter. And it's going through and enumerating each one of those objects. And as you can see, it looks like it did successfully create each one of these users. Let's jump back into the Exchange Admin Center now. And we'll look. We'll refresh our screen and see if we've got our users. And it looks like we do. All right, so there's our users all nicely created for us. and and that is how we can um, we can do batch operations using EMS with the CSV file. I also want to show you real quick, I can type git dash mailbox, and this is another way that I can see my mailboxes from within the EMS. All right. 
Okay, so hopefully that gives you guys a good understanding now of how we can do these batch operations uh, using EMS with the help of a CSV file. Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed getting to experience a little bit of this course, and I hope you'll join me on the full adventure. If you'll check the description of this video, you'll see a link that'll show you how you can get access to the full course. Now, in the full course, you're going to learn how to set up a practice environment where you can practice hands-on, and I'm going to provide you with lots of virtual simulations that you can do 24-7. All you need is a web browser. So I hope you'll join me, and uh, I hope you'll also give me a like and subscribe. I'm trying very, very hard to get the uh, this channel to build and grow, and uh, so I hope you'll take the time to do that.